Hello, glad to see you on my channel. I really value it. And today I want to share with you a wonderful story. It's a dramatic story that will come as a total shock to everybody. It is a really amazing story. So enjoy watching it. Lucy looked anxiously at her granddaughter. The elderly woman's anxiety was so strong that she involuntarily moved her hand, which was tightened by the cuff of the tenometer. But the house doctor, with all the sternness of an elementary school teacher, remarked to the grandmother, I asked you to lie still, and your hands are twitching. You'll have to try it on again, the teacher told the grandmother, expressing her displeasure. The patient made an expressive gesture that spoke eloquently of her displeasure at wasting time if it was already clear. There was both despair and indignation in the older woman's voice, but Cindy had long since gotten used to her grandmother's maneuvers paying no attention to the old woman's size. She was pumping the cuff to the limit again. Lucy, for propriety's sake, bore it obediently, but she would not express her feelings in words. She watched her granddaughter's actions, expecting a death sentence, but Cindy didn't live up to that expectation. Grandma, you could be on the astronaut team, couldn't you? 130 over 80. That's the score of a well-trained athlete. She didn't like her granddaughter's tone, let alone the results. Acting gravely ill, she changed from a horizontal to a sitting position. Your machine is lying. You can throw it away for lack of use. Too bad mine broke down at the wrong time, but it was always right. I can tell from my condition that my upper blood pressure is off the charts, at least 200. Cindy was well versed in the intricacies of her grandmother's character and didn't even take offense at her assessment of the imported device's abilities. Okay, if you don't trust me, let me call an ambulance, Cindy said. Lucy's face changed instantly, and her entire large body expressed outrage. With a bloodthirsty tone in her voice, she declared, Is this where the dog is buried? I knew it. I could feel it. You and your mother are so eager to shove me into the hospital to be finally finished off. Cindy laughed. Grandma, the hospital is where people get healed. And the fact that mom and I are trying to talk some sense into you is the opposite, a sign of caring. You have no idea how much we love you. The granddaughter hugged the woman tightly and kissed her deeply wrinkled cheeks. Lucy was touched. More than anything else in the world, she treasured such moments. The burden of years had left many wounds on the old lady's heart, and not all of them had healed completely. So she wished her family would pay more attention to her. Today, too. Towards morning, she felt uncomfortable with loneliness, as if it was following her from every corner. At times like that, she was very afraid. That's why she called Cindy. But the girl did not even reproach her relative for such an early call. Remembering it now, Lucy decided to apologize. Cindy, I'm sorry I got you up at 600, but I thought the woman with the side that was already at the bedside. I know it's time to get ready, but I just want to live a little longer. It's okay. It's okay. I have to be at work by 8 o'clock anyway. I don't like your moody attitude. There's a saying that as long as you're alive, you should think about life. Yeah, I try to think. When I look in the mirror, I get so scared. Lucy is obviously flirting because she looks quite good for her age. Despite her advanced age, she looks after herself and likes new outfits. Her daughter and granddaughter try to please her every wish. And Marie, Cynthia's mother, many times offered her to move into her spacious apartment, but the grandmother categorically rejects this possibility. I've never lived and I want to die in my own apartment. Tony and I earned those square meters with our own labor. Lucy liked to make her life an example to others. She used every opportunity to engage the other person in her memories. While Cindy was in the kitchen preparing breakfast, grandma didn't miss the opportunity either. If you knew granddaughter, how hard times were back then. Hunger, devastation, unsettled. People walked around happy because they valued life. Now they value money more. Cindy walked smoothly into the small living room with a tray. Everything's ready. Let's get breakfast. I'm really going to be late for work. You young people, all in a hurry. Where are you running to? In such a hurry to get married and then divorce, she said. You better tell me, Cindy, am I going to have great-grandchildren? It wasn't the first time her grandmother had started a conversation on the subject, but the girl had always shrugged it off, replying that she had to get married first. Lucy set her cup to the side and eyed her granddaughter curiously. 
So why the affair? Have all the men in Russia disappeared? Vaughn, your grandfather Tony, came back from the war without one leg, and there was no shortage of brides. But your grandfather chose you, and proudly so, the old woman said. Who else could he choose but a labor striker? I have so many diplomas, and even have awards from the government. At that time, such girls were valued. Yes, and your grandfather, despite his disability, was an extraordinary man and looked back on women for others, so you had to be on your guard. Cindy knew Grandma's love story well, but each time new details emerged. Lucy had never told her before that Tony had shown a weakness for the female sex. You never told me about Grandpa's adventures, Grandma, Cindy said. A heavy sigh was heard. It's not customary to speak ill of the dead. He drank my blood, your grandfather. Still, I loved him and forgave him everything. It's easy now. Anything goes wrong, and we're off in different directions. We put up with it because we were ashamed. We'd also felt sorry for the kids. Tony had three of them on the spot. The women at the construction site laughed at me, saying, Do you go to the maternity hospital like you go to work? Every year at almost the same time. That was our life, and we loved each other dearly, Lucy said. Cindy looked at the antique clock that was inexorably counting the minutes. Of course, Grandma, I always enjoy talking to you, but I don't want to be late for work. But I want to tell you in confidence that maybe soon your wish will come true. Oh, Lucy exclaimed. Cindy, do you know what I mean? Who is he, tell me? The girl replied, don't you understand? Just don't tell anyone yet. But I myself don't know what will happen to Steve yet. He's a simple and very kind guy. We've been dating for almost a year now, and my parents don't know. Cindy quickly cleared the table and was preparing to leave, but she remembered something important and stopped. Why are you so anxious to wait for great-grandchildren? She asked. Lucy sighed expressively again. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that a woman who is lucky enough to have great-grandchildren is forgiven her sins. Cindy laughed. I had no idea you were superstitious. That's news to me. I'm a striker and a communist, and believing in omens doesn't mix all that well. Life is such a thing that sometimes incompatible things happen. Whoever thought the world would turn upside down like this? As Cindy walked to the bus stop, she couldn't get her grandmother's last remark out of her head about the world being upside down. Mentally, she recognized the old lady's right because really, just in the last few years, things had changed a lot. So many people were trying to keep the good and kind relationships that had brought them together before. When Cindy crossed the threshold of the office where 12 employees peacefully coexisted, Jane immediately turned her attention to her. Why are you late? The person in charge was already coming in. Good thing I didn't notice your absence. What's wrong with you? She asked. Cindy tried to explain with gestures. What's the big deal? Can you elaborate? Said Jane. Only brides and Christmas trees shine like that. What kind of day is it today? First grandma's been asking me since this morning when I'm getting married and now you. Okay, I'm going to give you some up-to-date information just for you. I'm not planning a wedding yet, but I might be suitable for the role of a Christmas tree, she said jokingly. You're joking, but I know you and Steve are serious, so I hope to be your friend at the wedding, at least near someone else's happiness, Cindy added. The desks were tightly arranged, the friends standing close together, so no one would pay attention to their conversation. Cindy moved even closer to Jane. I don't get it. You and Tim were okay, weren't you? She asked. Cindy was shocked by Jane's confession. To be honest, I was even jealous of you. Everything looked so beautiful and romantic. What was the reason for your breakup? Did he lie to you or betray you? Cindy asked. Jane replied, well, you'd have to try really hard to lie to me. It's just that times are hard for both of us right now and Tim is working casual jobs. And I, as a young and beautiful girl, want to live in constant celebration, and preferably every day. Cindy couldn't believe her ears. So what happened to love? She asked. Jane looked at her as if seeing her for the first time. I didn't realize you were naive to that extent. Love is when you have the ability to satisfy your little whims at someone else's expense, she said. Cindy made the decision not to discuss her boyfriend with Jane again. She wasn't satisfied with her friend's assessment of their relationship. 
Instead, she suggested switching to work to avoid repercussions for their longtime relationship. Although Cindy still felt an unpleasant residue after the conversation, Valerie was not embarrassed by it, and she did not insist on continuing to discuss the topic. At the end of the workday, Cindy agreed to go for a walk with Jane, although she had her own plans for the evening. She realized that Jane would take up a lot of her time and she was a little uneasy. Okay, I'll try to make you feel a little better, Cindy said. She didn't have time to finish her sentence, however, when Jane was already clapping her hands happily. Mittens and Snowflake, yay. I haven't been to a movie in ages, she exclaimed. Cindy didn't have time to add that she and Steve wanted to go to the movie alone. When Steve saw that Cindy had shown up for a date with Jane, he showed no surprise since they had met several times before with this friend. Steve took a negative impression of Jane and expressed his displeasure that she had joined their cultural event. He hinted that he had only expected to spend time with Cindy. Jane was not surprised at this hint and laughed out loud. We can buy a term. True, it will cost three times as much, but the matter will be settled, she said. She turned Steve's attention to a hooded guy standing nearby and pointed at him in surprise. That guy over there sure has tickets, Jane said. Steve was surprised. You're even informed in such matters. Steve marveled. Yeah, it's dangerous to be friends with you, he continued. Jane smiled back. That's how you have to one and two and produce an effect, she said. On the contrary, it's very useful to be friends with me. And this fellow I know because I've bought clothes from him more than once. He used to paint on rags, imported from abroad, she added. Steve. Please hurry up, otherwise Cindy and I are about to turn into icicles. It's arctic cold, she urged. Cindy had been silent the whole time, not expecting her friend to act so openly in the presence of her boyfriend. She hadn't noticed Jane's habits before, such as laughing loudly or pointing a finger at a person in public. She even regretted that she hadn't culturally summoned up her friend, for whom she now had to blush in front of Steve. Somewhere inside her, a warning beacon went off. Watch out, or your best friend will steal your boyfriend. But by the look of Steve and his mood, it was easy to guess that Jane annoyed him a lot. During the session, her friend didn't hold back much either. She was commenting aloud on the actions of the characters and was constantly cutting her in her seat. Therefore, Cindy did not thickly and did not watch the picture with the participation of a famous Italian actor. Jane, on the other hand, had quite a bit. I was so looking forward to seeing this movie. Thank you, Steve. Jane's gaze on Steve was so intrusive that Cindy became uncomfortable. It seemed to her that her friend was completely oblivious to the fact that Steve was dating her. In a minute, she could have literally pounced on him. Friends, I don't understand why you have those facial expressions like you just drank a spoonful of fish oil. Remember when they used to feed it to us at daycare? Jane burst into loud laughter. Cindy just nodded in response. Not wanting to delve further into this awkward moment, she was already ready to say goodbye to her friend as they stood in the driveway of Jane's house. But Jane wasn't going to part so easily. Guys, I understand, but I'm warning you that I will be a bridesmaid at your wedding and no other candidates are being considered, she stated. Steve replied calmly that he had to upset Valerie because he and Cindy would not be having a wedding. The joy on Jane's face was instantly replaced with surprise. She couldn't realize that Steve was also refusing to get married and wasn't even embarrassed to say so publicly. In response, Steve skillfully put the insolent girl in her place. Cindy watched with satisfaction as Jane struggled to comprehend the meaning of the words. Steve explained that their decision to forego a noisy wedding didn't mean that anyone was leaving anyone behind. They just wanted to have a wedding without the publicity of going to a registry office and spend the money on something useful. Jane was quite surprised by this. She compared them to American movies where the characters go on a trip right after the wedding. Steve, you're good, she said. For the next 15 minutes, all three of them started jumping in place to keep warm because the frost was already creeping through their warm clothes. Finally, Jane gave up. That was a nice evening tonight. Why don't we go to the restaurant again like this? She suggested. Cindy tried to apologize to Steve for Jane's behavior. I'm sorry you had to listen to Jane's coddling. She's generally a nice girl. It's just that something happened today and she snapped. I didn't expect it to get so ugly myself, she said. Yes, we had to communicate with different people. 
But one thing I don't understand is what you two have in common. You're so different, Steve said. Well, there's no mystery. It's just that we've been friends since we were kids. Went to daycare together, sat at the same desk. Jane's always been reckless. Her dad is a big shot, and she's used to always getting what she wants, Cindy explained. But her daddy better teach her some manners, he added. I had a hard time holding back when she started asking about our wedding. I really wanted to sass her, Steve admitted. Cindy experienced the shock of such an announcement. She froze in place, feeling her heart begin to beat harder. What? Are you serious? She squeezed out of herself. Steve stepped closer and took her hand in his. Yes, I am serious. I thought tonight would be the right time, but now everything has changed. Do you agree? He asked. Cindy was at a complete loss. She was silent for a long time, worrying and thinking about how things had turned so suddenly. Finally, she turned her head towards Steve and said quietly, Yes, I agree. Of course you do. Half of the procedure is done, and now for part two. Please, maestro, fanfare. Steve Dirachier played the orchestra himself, and then solemnly extracted a velvet box from his pocket. Here, as is proper on such occasions, is a ring. The girl opened the box in the color of a street lamp, and a jewel winked cheerfully at her with a bright gleam. Oh, it's a real diamond, she exclaimed. It was the happiest day of Cindy's life. She couldn't sleep for a long time, replaying every minute of the wonderful evening. On that frosty February night, spring was ringing in her heart, and she believed that the best was yet to come. The first year in married life flew by. Cindy couldn't escape the feeling that it was all happening in a dream. The women at work jeered at her. There's a vibe going around from our Cindy. You can get a free load of happiness. You shouldn't flaunt your prosperous life, she said. Cindy sensed the sadness in her friend's voice and realized that Jane felt jealousy and envy. She looked at Jane with compassion and said, Jane, each of us is going our own way. You will find your happiness, absolutely. I, on the other hand, am just lucky to have such a wonderful partner in life as Steve. Jane smiled and nodded. Yes, you're right, Cindy. I'm happy for you. It's just hard to deal with your own emotions sometimes, she admitted. Their friendship had continued, but since then Jane had become more circumspect in her comments and hadn't openly expressed her envious feelings. The girl wondered. On the contrary, it always seemed to me that happy people radiate kindness. Personally, I am ready to share it with anyone. What do you mean, Steve? Are you going to rent your own? Jane didn't expect you to say that. If you weren't my friend, I'd be really mad at you. Sometimes I feel like you're not happy for me or I owe you something. Cindy almost cried with resentment, so Jane tried to remedy the situation. Why do you say that? You know, I don't mean that. Well, my tongue's just so bad. It's just talking nonsense. No offense. I'm not upset with you, Steve, about the wedding that didn't work out. The tension was relieved, and both girls smiled at the end of the meal when they put down their plates of dessert. Jane asked Cindy with a piercing sadness, what is happiness like? I guess it's different for each person. You know, I recently came across a collection of poems by a poetess. Anyway, she lived through the war. There was love and betrayal in her life. One of her poems struck me. It's about happiness, which this woman had spent her whole life collecting in bits and pieces. But you can't get much happiness this way, although it is very beautifully said. Yes, beautiful and right. You know, Jane, my grandmother told me many times about her youth. I mean, Grandpa was legless, and she'd cut her throat for him. I'm sorry, I didn't put it well, but according to my beloved grandmother's stories, it used to be the man himself was valued, and it didn't matter what his physical shortcomings were. It was what was inside that mattered. Jane looked at Cindy with wide eyes. Well, you're a real piece of work, girlfriend. You shouldn't be in accounting. You should be lecturing at some liberal arts college. And I'll be leaving accounting soon. What? Another surprise. Steve, did you get another job? You could say that. We're about to have a new addition. This news took Valerie by surprise. She did not have time to prepare for it internally, and on her pretty face flashed a displeased grimace. But quickly pulling herself together, the girl read naively, Cindy, I'm so happy for you. I mean for the two of you. Of course, so much happiness, and in one hand, it can be mind-boggling. But if I missed your wedding, where I wanted to be a bridesmaid, at least take me as your godparent. 
Cindy made no promises. She dodged a direct answer with the catchphrase, I have to have a baby and then think about everything else. By the way, my grandmother used to say that you shouldn't even buy clothes for an unborn child. It's a very bad omen. And it seems to me that all this is nonsense. Ancient beliefs, as they say, what is to be, that will not pass. Personally, when I get ready for motherhood, I'll prepare everything in advance for the baby. How I envy you now. I want it all too. To reassure her friend, Cindy advised, you will have it all, Jane. You just have to change your outlook on life a little. A crane in the sky looks more attractive because it's high up in the distance and the imperfections are not noticeable. I get the hint. But the tits in your version won't do me any good. It's easy for you to reason because your Steve has achieved what others have not. He's got a good job and a good salary. You're behind him like a wall, but a tit. It's a utopia. Anyone who can't make it to the sky needs help. I'm not ready to be a wall. And I'm not ready. Cindy wasn't in the habit of imposing her opinion on others. She decided that there was no point in arguing with her friend about the values of life. After this conversation, their paths began to diverge in different directions. Cindy began to avoid eating together at the cafeteria, and Jane didn't insist. Soon her friend was promoted and Jane decided to celebrate her professional triumph with a bang. Girls on such an occasion and I do not hide the glade. The meeting place is the Pines campground outside of town. Please don't be late. After handing out the instructions, Jane walked over to the table where Cindy was sitting. I hope you're not afraid from the collective, she said. But Cindy pointed to her belly. Where am I going with a watermelon like that? If it were still here locally, then I'd be sure to spend time in warm company. I'm not going out of town. I don't want to take any chances. Well, suit yourself, Jane objected. A month before her maternity leave, Cindy felt ill. Her legs were swelling badly. There were unsightly spots on her face. After conferring with her husband, she decided to take a leave of absence. With application in hand, she entered the supervisor's office without knocking. Jane, I need a vacation, Cindy said. Jane glared at her with an unfriendly look. First of all, it's not Jane, it's Jane Croft. And secondly, cultured people knock before entering the supervisor's office. What have you got there? Although the freshly promoted supervisor could clearly see that Cindy was having difficulty standing, she didn't even offer her a chair. On the contrary, she studied the short text of only two lines for several minutes. I'm sorry, but I have to turn you down. The annual report is coming up, you understand. But I'm going on maternity leave in less than a month anyway, Cindy objected. So you'll go on vacation like you're supposed to in a month. Cindy was already at the door when she heard the sarcastic words. So how's your happiness going? She's been picking a lot of seeds, care to share. Cindy was struck not by the words, but by the tone with which her friend spewed her gloating. But the new boss decided to continue. Now look at you and me and answer me, which one of us is happier? You're painful to look at. Sprawled out like a frog. I'm in shape. Good position, salary, respect. I'll settle in a little and I'll find a husband. Cindy could almost physically feel the last thread that had connected her to her friend severed. It must have taken a toll on her health because that evening she was admitted to the hospital. Steve was very worried about the condition of the spouse and the future child, but the doctor assured that everything will be fine. There is no particular reason to worry. Just your wife was a little nervous but it will pass imperceptibly. She'll rest up here and be able to go home in a couple weeks. The doctor wasn't lying. Indeed, Cindy was soon discharged. And the doctor joked one last time, we'll be gone for a while. Get your strength back and come back for the baby. The rest of the time before the birth, Cindy intensively prepared for future motherhood. She reread a lot of useful literature, but she liked the book by the famous American pediatrician Benjamin Spock. When Steve caught his wife reading this treatise, he was surprised. I see that you are already very ready, and I'm allowed to study the references after all. I want to take a very active part too. I'm all for it. Here you go, Cindy replied. Steve took the book, but it was obvious that his mind was on something else. Cindy decided to help him out. Honey, is there something you wanted to ask me? There is this, listen, I was at a meeting at City Hall the other day and I was almost speechless when I saw your friend there. 
Jane, I think. Yes, that's the one. But we don't talk to her anymore. If it's no secret, why? No secret. It's just that even a little power changes a person a great deal. I see. I'll keep that in mind. I almost invited her to come over to our house. Why didn't you say anything to me? Cindy, why? Steve, you've probably faced a situation at least once in your life where you've realized that you don't want to be with someone. That's what happened with Jane and me. Our friendship turned out to be a bubble, but I don't regret our breakup. It's just a little bitter. Steve, it'll pass, especially since you won't have to go back to your accounting department. Cindy, have you made up your mind for me? Steve, no, but I'd like to suggest a change of field. We're opening several branches soon and we'll need to expand our staff. Jane, okay, honey, I'll think about it, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Although the whole family was worried about Cindy, Steve found a true friend and soulmate in Lucy. Cindy's grandmother reassured the future father, never bring yourself down. Everything will be fine. All women give birth. It's our lot by nature, and Cindy will do just fine. The man wanted to believe the wise woman's words, but anxiety for his wife and child lingered. Thank you, Lucy, for your support. Your words to God's ears. Don't worry, honey. Heaven hears everything and angels are already circling ready to protect your baby. Cindy's father stayed on the phone. Finally, he shouted with joy. That's it. The girl has a granddaughter. Despite the late hour, the relatives hurried to the hospital. Even Lucy decided to keep up with the company. Cindy's mother wanted to cool the old lady's ardor. Mom, where are you going skying? Why don't you stay home? No, I'm not. I'd waited this long for this day to stay home. When the delegation of relatives showed up at the emergency room, the nurse on duty looked at the unusual team with surprise. Hold on, I'll call the ward now. Not two minutes later, the girl appeared. Who was the father of the newborn, she asked. Steve took a step forward. Aya. Wait, a little while now the doctor will be here. He wants to talk to you. The girl tried not to look into the eyes of the happily smiling Steve. There was also a strange expression on the face of the doctor who had invited him into the office. But the doctor's first words shocked the man. It's very hard for me to say this, but the little girl wasn't born completely healthy. She has a severe heart defect, and she needs special care now. We have everything ready at home. The conditions are perfect. You misunderstand me. The baby can't breathe on her own, so we're gonna put her in a kivet. It's a special chamber where she'll be given oxygen. When she gets a little stronger in a couple of weeks, we'll send her to the perinatal center where she'll have surgery. Steve wasn't quite sure what the doctor was talking about. What surgery? What are you talking about? I mean, she's just a tiny little thing. Tell me honestly, without surgery, the baby won't survive. Your wife doesn't know anything yet. It was a difficult labor, and we decided not to tell her anything yet. So it's your decision. If it's about saving the baby's life, of course I agree. But how could this happen? Why? No one can give you a definite answer to that question. The most important thing now is to determine the treatment strategy. Do not despair. Although it is a difficult path, not all is lost. You will have to do several operations, but be courageous and patient. Basically, now the future of the baby depends on you and your wife. Steve walked out of the doctor's office and slumped down on the couch. Cindy's parents and grandmother looked anxiously at the burning father. Steve, Dove, tell me what happened. Lucy asked, clutching at the man's arm. Cindy's parents also stood with lost faces. What's wrong with Cindy? Steve, don't be quiet. Steve lowered his head slightly and wandered toward the exit. Lucy tried to catch up with him. You can't paint it like that. They cure such diseases today, and they'll cure my granddaughter. Steve stopped and looked at the older woman with his manly smile. I envy your optimism, Lucy, but I don't believe in angels and heavenly powers anymore. And for nothing, you should believe. Faith gives you strength. At first, Steve tried to follow his wife's grandmother's advice. He helped his wife in everything, on whose shoulders fell all the hardest. After the first operation, which little Lily was made when she was only a month and a half, the girl quickly went on the mend. As it should be, a healthy baby, she in a year already independently ran and happily made a mess in the apartment. 
but it is known that trouble comes from where no one expects it. Young parents rejoiced at every success of their daughter and tried to diversify her leisure time. They did not refuse the invitation of a colleague at work, whose daughter was a few months older than Lily. Steve, come as a family to Sarah's birthday party, she's turning two. We want to make it a fun day. The party was a great success. Happy Cindy and Steve watched their daughter play with other children with enthusiasm. However, two days later, problems appeared. The girl started choking and her temperature continued to be high. For two weeks, the child was rescued in intensive care, but a trivial cold left serious consequences. Lily never fully recovered, and she required oxygen every half an hour. The young family faced severe financial difficulties, as most of the budget was spent on medicines and trips to the best clinics. Although relatives helped as much as they could, but the funds were clearly not enough. And then there was a distinguished professor, to whom they almost got to a consultation, said. The situation is grave. The little girl's heart is like an old woman's. It can't withstand even minimal stress. Cindy pleaded, what can we do? Help us save the girl. The professor philosophized, sometimes medicine is powerless. You have a special case, but tears and prayers can't help. The only correct solution, in my opinion, would be a second operation to install an artificial valve but it's still a temporary measure. In the long run, transplant help will be needed. Steve was wary. Professor, what you're saying is that, yes, you read me correctly, your daughter will need a donor heart, but I want to warn you right away that the waiting list for such an operation is scheduled for years in advance. They say that shared grief brings people closer together, but Cindy and Steve were working against that law. Six months after consulting a famous professor, Lally had a second operation, but it had almost no positive results. The girl was practically unable to exist without the machine through which she breathed. Therefore, Cindy could not take her out even for a walk. For the mother and the sick girl, the whole world was limited to the size of their two-room apartment with a balcony. Downstairs, life was very different, but despite her serious illness, Lily was not discouraged. She was homeschooled and eagerly awaited the arrival of her teachers. Another passion of the girl was drawing. In her incomplete eight years, Lily with great talent conveyed all the shades and details of her drawings. She enjoyed showing her work to anyone who was interested. One day, a teacher who came every day said, your girl has talent. If you don't mind, I'll show her drawings to an artist I know who teaches at the Academy of Art. At first, Cindy didn't pay much attention to these words but soon several of her daughter's works were given to the teacher. But soon the burden of everyday life became so heavy that Cindy forgot all about it. One day she confessed to her mother, who visited them every day. I feel like a snail in a shell. I imagine how my sweet grandmother would be reading these words right now. I wish she were around. I miss her very much. Mom was a real optimist. The only time I ever saw her cry was when my dad died. The rest of the time, she always had a smile on her face and filled the whole family with joy. Although we don't so much want to be like grandma, for some reason we can't seem to make it work. Especially lately, the constant moping won't let go. I'm just hanging in there for Lily. And Steve. I mean, he's always been there for me. Or has something changed? I didn't want to dump my problems on my mother's head. But I felt a strong need to share them with someone. I don't know if it was just my sick imagination. But Steve had changed a lot, especially in the last year. He's become irritable and even rude to me. He hardly ever goes into Lily's room. You should talk to him. I tried, but he refuses to talk to me directly. I get the impression he's afraid. Afraid of me and Lily and everything that's going on here. You know, Mom, my husband's been coming home later and later. So I'm starting to think he's got another woman. And if he leaves us, I don't know how we're going to live. Don't worry, your father and I always have a shoulder to lean on. And Steve is such a responsible man. I'm sure he wouldn't do something so mean. Oh, mom, I can't be sure of that. He's not the same. Suddenly, Cindy remembered the teacher who had praised Lily's talent. I'm totally boring you, but there's some good news, she said. Nico, the teacher took some drawings to show the artist. Of course, I don't believe in all the Cinderella tales, but who knows? Marie said thoughtfully. I told you a hundred times that my granddaughter is a diamond, 
It's unbelievable for such a sick child to draw so well. You should hire tutors or art education teachers for her. Ma, I'd love to, but with what money? We're barely making ends meet. Medicines are so expensive, and we only have one breadwinner, and he's often in a bad mood. I don't think these lessons will cost much. My father and I will help. Maybe our Lily will become a famous artist. By the way, where is she? Cindy nodded toward the balcony, where her daughter had organized a plain air painting session. Although you can hardly call it a real nature, it's a small oasis of green under our balcony. The girl was passionately painting, sticking out her tongue. The mask of the device did not interfere with the creative process, and the young artist deftly corrected it every time she changed her body position. Marie leaned over to examine her granddaughter's work. Well done, my good one, she said. Suddenly, the mask slid off the girl's face, and she began to cramp her mouth. The grandmother quickly fixed the device. You are not allowed to make any sudden movements, and you can't even get excited much either, she said. Grandma, don't be afraid for me. I'm used to it by now. An auntie told us that soon I'll get a special device, so I can go outside with it. Cindy confirmed from afar. Yes, we have a foundation aide, Sonny, taking over Lily's patronage. They promised to help with the purchase of a new machine. But how long will we have to wait until enough funds are raised? Lily unhappily interrupted her mother. Mom, you've been talking to Grandma for almost an hour. Now it's my turn. Cindy relented to her daughter and said, Okay, dear, I'll shut up and won't bother you. I'd better head to the kitchen and make something delicious. While her mother was busy in the kitchen, Lily called out to her grandmother and asked, Grandma, do you want to look at something? Mom and Dad's anniversary is coming up. How did they get married? Marie asked in surprise, How do you know, granddaughter? Lily replied with confidence, Do you think I'm just a little kid? I even walk around the apartment by myself sometimes without that nasty thing. The girl nodded at her mask and said, don't think that if a man has a bad heart, his head doesn't work. I understand perfectly well. Marie was amazed at this maturity of thinking in a sick girl. She asked, who put you up to this? Lily replied, Grandma, you're so full of it. I saw on TV a boy with no arms painting with his lips. I have arms and legs, but they'll replace my heart later. That's what the professor said. She laughed and said, oh, well, you totally distracted me. I wanted to show you the drawing I'm going to give to mom and dad. Lily rummaged through her drawing folder and in a second pulled out a bright and colorful drawing. It was easy to recognize Lily and her parents in the three smiling people in the drawing. The little girl corrected her mask machiniatically and asked with undisguised pleasure, isn't it great? That's just great. You're so smart. Tears came to Maria's eyes, but she tried not to upset her granddaughter and left the balcony saying, I'm going to go to your mom to help, and you keep drawing. The drawing with a positive story was left on the balcony. Apparently, the little artist forgot to hide it in her folder. In the evening, Steve, as usual, came in when his wife and daughter were already asleep. Steve, seeing the drawing, stopped and examined it carefully. It's Lily's, he said. She wanted to give it to us as a wedding anniversary present, but she forgot to put her drawing away after talking to Grandma. Steve didn't notice his wife approaching, despite her illness. Our Lily is drawing and trying to live the life of a normal child, and she's succeeding, she said. Too bad you don't notice that. Cindy silently retired to her bedroom. Steve looked at the drawing in the moonlight for a long time. Cindy hoped her husband would find something in himself that would make him go back to the man she knew, but he remained silent and just went to bed. In the morning, he left for work, also silent. Cindy knew from his phone conversations that he was up for a promotion, and she justified his constant delays with that. Steve's promotion made Cindy happy, of course, because it was an extra raise, and maybe they could buy Lily something more expensive that would help her better than the domestic medication. The next day, however, something happened that shook Cindy badly. Close to lunchtime, the doorbell rang. Cindy, slightly taken aback, let them inside. Strange, who could come unannounced. Standing on the doorstep was the same teacher who had admired Lily's drawings and had taken some of them to show her. Next to her was a man in his 60s. Hello, Cindy. I apologize for the unexpected. Allow me to introduce you. 
This is Mark, an artist and teacher from the Academy of Art, introduced the teacher. Cindy thought she had heard his last name before on TV when he was being presented with an award. Hello, please come in, she greeted them. The man immediately took a seat next to Lily. They started talking and his eyebrows went up every now and then in surprise. He then asked Lily if she had any of her most favorite drawings. The girl smiled. Cindy nodded in agreement. Yes, I realize Lily has talent, she said, looking at her daughter with pride. She tries hard and loves to draw. We always support her in that. Mark smiled. That's great, he said. I can see that you are very caring parents. I would like to offer Lily art lessons. I'm sure she can develop her talent even more with our help. Cindy happily agreed and the girl smiled knowing that her dream of having her own art drawing lessons was beginning to come true. Cindy was amazed at the offer and gratefully agreed. Since then, Lolly has been actively practicing with her personal teacher, developing her talent and learning new techniques and methods. Her work was exhibited in several shows and she began to be recognized as a young artist. Cindy was very proud of her daughter and they enjoyed attending all of her shows. Lily rejoiced in each new accomplishment and was grateful to her family and teacher for their support and belief in her talent. Their little oasis of green under the balcony became a symbol of hope and strength with which they overcame all difficulties and fought for Lily's bright future. On family day, it's a joyous occasion. Lily met on the rise because a few days before she was given a new machine. Therefore, the master of drawing could attend the presentation herself. Cindy tried not to let her daughter notice how bad she felt. As soon as it was known that the exhibition was definitely going to be, they were announced the date and time Cindy tried to tell her husband about it. However, it didn't work on the first day. It was already past zero o'clock, so Cindy got up early to make breakfast for Steve early and over breakfast to tell him all about it. He walked into the kitchen, looked surprised at the amount of pancakes and scrambled eggs. Then he looked at Cindy and sighed visibly and sat down at the table. Steve, do you want coffee or tea? Coffee. She set the mug in front of him. Steve, I need to talk to you. Cindy, I've got a lot on my mind right now. I'd like to eat my breakfast too, so I can concentrate. She could see that her husband was having trouble holding back, but she wasn't gonna back down. Okay, but what about when you're never here? I need to talk. I need to work things out. After all, you can. Cindy stepped back to the window and turned away from him. Steve looked at her closely for the first time in a long time. She had these jeans from before she was pregnant. They were so frayed they seemed purposely frayed. Some kind of uniform t-shirt. Cindy appeared very thin in it, though she did seem to have lost a lot of weight. Her hair was in bunches, he hated that bun always. But she used to laugh and reply, Do I have to sweep up dust with my hair? Yes, Cindy has changed a lot. If it's so obvious on a young woman, what to say about him and his pants. It's also about to be a year old. Sure, he has others, but it's still a long time since he buys what he wants. Yes, he doesn't buy anything at all. Doesn't make anything of what he wants. All he does is work and bring in money. Sometimes he feels like he goes home after his paycheck, throws all the money into a big pot that's burning like hell and immediately realizes that he can turn around and go back to work because there's no more money. Lately, Steve has been realizing that he's tired. Tired of it all. He doesn't want to live like this anymore. Yes, Cynthia loves him, and it's not Lily's fault, but he's human too. He hasn't done anything wrong in front of God. He shouldn't have to carry all this. He's not even 40 yet, and he feels like he's well into his 60s, so the life he hasn't lived is over. There's nothing ahead of him. I mean, it's the same as it is now. Cindy turned around and Steve saw the determination in her eyes. Cindy, don't get me started. We'll talk. We'll talk about everything. Give me a few days to gather my thoughts. She agreed abruptly. Okay, let's do it Friday. We can't take it any further. We have a show on Sunday. She was about to say exhibition, but Steve was already out. Cindy grinned sadly. It had been over a year since he kissed her when he came and kissed her when he left. At first she cried, resentful, and then she just accepted it. By Friday, she and her mom had bought Lily a beautiful dress. It was the first big event of her life after all. Steve didn't come home on Friday. 
He didn't show up until Saturday, but there was no way to wake him up that night to go to the exhibit. Cindy could definitely smell the booze. It was so strange. Steve didn't like to drink at all. Anyway, they were already running late, so they left him to sleep and went to the expo. Marie, is he really rambling? What kind of father is that? Such an event and he can't go to the baby. Mom couldn't even manage to tell her about him and the event because Steve is never home. Marie gasped with indignation, but that's okay, she'll talk to Steve again. Cindy has fallen out of love. It happens, but the baby had nothing to do with it. The show was a real success. So many words were said for Lily that the girl got excited and even had to take medication. But grandma and mom saw it coming. That's why there were no consequences. And then already at the very end of the holiday, Mark brought a man to them. Lovely ladies, please love and complain. This is my son, Rick. He was the organizer of the party. Cindy smiled involuntarily. Mark spoke of this son with poorly concealed pride. Good evening. I'm very pleased that my father was not wrong again. Creative people catch fire very quickly. But tonight, shocked, though my dad says I don't know how to feel like artists. Cindy had time to get a good look at the man while they engaged in quite the small talk. About 40 years old, maybe a little more. Very personable, austere. But not until he started smiling. A mischievous boy's smile. And at that moment, it was clear that no, he was 40 and could not be. Actually, I approached you for two reasons, or rather, two things. One, Cindy, several people would like to buy your daughter's drawings since she is underage. Our man who handles auctions and sales will help decide on the price. And two, I'd like to invite you all to a restaurant to celebrate such a success, but I guess that won't be possible, the man said looking pityingly at a tired and pensive Lily. Yes, unfortunately there is no way. Lily should be resting long ago, Cindy replied. But then Marie intervened. Cindy, I think an event like this should definitely be celebrated on this very day. You could invite Rick and Mark to our house, she suggested. Cindy smiled modestly. She was embarrassed by her mom's words, but now some words from her were required. Okay, let's do Tuesday. It's Lily's free day. No classes, Cindy said. Rick smiled contentedly. Oh, how pleased I am. If only who knew, I hate these restaurants. Here's my whole life across my throat, and I'm always mixing up forks, he confessed. Cindy was immediately relieved. She'd been thinking frantically for a second before he said that, wondering how to get everything set up and ready so she wouldn't fall on her face. Turns out great people can be ordinary, too. They agreed on a time, and Rick offered them a ride. Mary Toniova immediately said she had somewhere else to be, so Cindy and Lily had to drive alone. They talked mostly about the exhibit and the house. Rick smiled. So I'll see you the day after tomorrow. Does that work out? He asked. That's great. By then, I think we'll have our buyers decided, replied Cindy. They said their goodbyes warmly. Lily could barely move her legs. I called it, Cindy thought. She immediately put the girl to bed. She heard Steve splashing in the bathroom. Very good, she thought. Now they're going to talk. Well, he's not so callous as not to be pleased with his daughter's success. About 20 minutes later, the bathroom door opened and Steve appeared in the kitchen. He didn't even ask where they were, as if a kid with an oxygen mask on his face was constantly and freely walking around. Yes, we're home. It's really good that you're home too. Otherwise, lately we only know about me having a husband and Lily having a daddy for memory, Cindy said. He turned sharply toward her. And I don't see what you're not happy about. I work like a wolf and I can't even afford anything. All the money is flying into the abyss. You must have forgotten that there is another life, a life that normal people live. They go to the movies, buy themselves expensive things. Their homes don't smell like medicine. They work to live a life of pleasure. Steve said bitterly. Basically, it's not living, it's just existing. I'm bored with it. Do you realize that? Steve said. Cindy, in a surprisingly calm voice said, and what do you suggest we change? What do we need to do to find a way out of this situation? You realize we can't change anything yet. That's right, we do, he added. But I can. Why agonize all together when at least one person can live a normal life? Steve. I don't understand you. Above all, 
with a shake of her head. She tried to understand his words. Cindy, I'm leaving. I don't care what you think of me, but I don't want to live like this anymore, Steve said and sat down at the table. Cindy felt the ground beneath her feet shake. Leaving, but it's death for Lily. she whispered with worry and fear. You know yourself that the medicine they give her hardly helps at all. We have to buy everything. How are we going to manage without you? Cindy said with pleading in her voice. Steve shook his head negatively. Cindy, don't try to pressure me with your pity. I'm not trying to. I want to understand. Are you consciously going into this knowing how it will affect our daughter? She asked bitterly. Steve silently stood up and walked out into the hallway. Cindy, crying, tried to follow him. Steve, please come to your senses. Think about what's going to happen to us, she screamed. But he only threw on his jacket and turning to her said, When you calm down, pack my things and don't try to look for me. Nothing will change. Then he closed the door behind him and Cindy folded herself on the floor, crying. What to do now? How to go on with her life? A few minutes later, she heard her daughter calling for her. Cindy hurried to her. Lily was pale, but Cindy didn't see anything serious. Mommy, can I draw? Lily asked. Cindy smiled. You draw all the time. Don't you get tired? She asked. No, Mommy, I like it so much. I even feel better, replied the girl. Cindy restrained herself so her daughter wouldn't notice her confusion. She didn't want to disturb the child. In the evening, when Lily was already asleep, Cindy sat down in the kitchen to assess the medications they had and what they had to buy. Cindy counted the money and realized they could get by for a couple of months if nothing went up in price. She clearly realized that if she didn't come up with anything in those two months, she would be finished. But the next day, she remembered that they had to have guests. Cindy had to set aside some more money from the budget for Lily. She did everything by machine, smiling at her daughter, cooking, talking to her. But her mind kept spinning with thoughts of how to handle the situation. The guests arrived on time, but Cindy's mom called to let her know that her dad was sick, so she wouldn't be able to come. Cindy couldn't get enough of the cold as well. You're sorry, daughter, I'll manage, and then somehow I'll be there on my own, she said, trying to reassure the child. Okay, mom, I'll manage. Mark and his son arrived right on time. Cindy smiled and invited them into the room. Mark immediately felt the atmosphere of home warmth. What are the scents? How can you give up such smells in favor of restaurant smells? He remarked. Rick smiled. Dad was always a stickler for home-cooked meals and family gatherings at home. Mom never managed to accustom him to the social life, he said. Why didn't you bring Mom along? Cindy asked. Cindy looked at Rick. She died 10 years ago. Daddy barely made it out. He loved her very much. Mom was an opera singer and sang until she died. She was a romantic. She was very much into glitz, glamour, he explained. Mark was quiet for a moment and apologized for his question. That's okay, Cindy replied, though inside she was upset. She realized who might have brought it up, but she decided to ignore it and spend the evening in a pleasant atmosphere. We're feeling better now. Mark's voice came from the room where he was talking to Lily. Cindy made a gesture toward the room and said, Come in, please. When they entered, Mark was standing by the table looking at something and quirking his eyebrows in a frown. He glanced quickly at Cindy and then said to Riku, Come here. Now both men were looking at the drawing and were silent. Cindy smiled and asked, What did you see in there? You know? Coincidentally, she wanted to take a look too, but Lily stopped her by saying, Mom, it's not finished yet. Lily quickly hid the drawing and Cindy was surprised, but decided not to argue with her daughter. She would ask her later why she wasn't allowed to show her unfinished drawings. As they sat at the table and listened to Mark marvel at each dish, Cindy relaxed a little. Rick pushed his plate away and said, So, can we talk business now? I have a card that receives funds from the sale of Lily's drawings and paintings. There's quite a bit of money already accumulated there. I'd like your permission to take some of the works to Italy. There's an annual young talent show there in a week, and the prize is very impressive. Cindy replied that she was not receiving any help from the foundation or a foundation of her own that she had set up. 
Mark apologized for such an uncomfortable question and said that he understood that the medications were not being allocated in sufficient quantities. Cindy explained that her husband had lost his job and now they were barely making ends meet. She felt she was all alone with her problems. She thought strongly that she needed to find a way out of this situation and secure a future for herself and her daughter. Cindy replied that her husband had left them a short time ago because he could no longer work just for her and the sick child. Rick felt awkward and choked on his tea. Mark clenched his fist in a show of support. Don't worry, Cindy. Everything that happens in life happens for the best, he said. Cindy smiled weakly. Meanwhile, Steve made his way to the park and sat down on a bench. Soon, a woman came over to him and sat down next to him. So, how did it go? She asked. How do you think? Steve replied. Jane placed her hand affectionately on his shoulder. Relax. All the bad things are behind us. There's only positivity ahead. In a month, you and I will go to the sea, she said, trying to encourage him. It will be a great reward for your torment. You'll come back with renewed vigor, Jane said. Let's get to work. I'm sure you're due for a promotion. You know how hard it was to breathe without oxygen. Yes, I understand, Steve replied. Jane, let's make a deal. Let's not bring them up again, he suggested. Sure, whatever you say, Jane agreed. So, shall we go home? I ordered dinner from the restaurant. I also bought some wonderful wine. I took the next day off, so we have the whole night off, she said with a smile. Steve smiled back. He would try to put everything that kept him from enjoying life out of his mind. This was the kind of life he had dreamed of shattering, or rather, when he had started hanging out with Jane. It had all happened suddenly, and he hadn't thought about cheating on Cindy, much less with Jane, whom he disliked since the very first day he met her. To be honest, he hadn't seen her in a long time. Probably since Cindy was still pregnant, he'd never once met her or had any interest in her. It didn't matter to him how his wife's ex-girlfriend lived. That day, his car failed to start again. And of course, it didn't happen outside his house, it happened at work. There was no public transportation running at that time, and cabs were too expensive, especially to the other side of town. He decided to walk to the nearest shuttle bus stop, very thirsty. Seeing a small store up ahead, Steve turned there to buy some water. At the door, he almost bumped into some woman. Excuse me, did you say something? He asked. And the lady suddenly said, Steve, isn't that you? Surprised, he looked up and saw Jane in front of him, well-groomed, wearing makeup and smelling of expensive perfume. He didn't immediately recognize her. What are you doing here at this hour? He asked. My car broke down and I'm walking to the center and you're driving. See, my head is working, she replied, smiling. Steve turned around and saw a bright blue BMW. That's a nice machine, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about giving you a ride. Go ahead, buy what you need and get out. I'll wait by the car Jane offered. Steve took the groceries he needed, walked out of the store and saw Jane, who was indeed standing by her car. Thanks for your help, he said as he got into the car. Well, let's go, Jane agreed. They moved further down the street and Steve felt that he and Jane not only knew each other, but were beginning to communicate again, opening their souls to each other. It was unexpected, but pleasant. Steve went to the counter, feeling mixed emotions. On the one hand, he didn't want to see Jane, but on the other, her presence seemed like fresh air, freeing him from his daily routine. He got into the car, which smelled of new leather, expensive perfume and something else, something dear and forgotten. Jane smiled and asked, you like it? She even laughed. You talk as if you're living on starvation yourself. You had a good job, as I recall, but jobs don't disappear, do they? Though everything else can certainly be lacking. I mean, Lily's sick and all our income goes to her medical care. Cindy doesn't work, so we can't afford all the extra expenses. Believe me, I'm sick of it all too, Steve said and was afraid of his own words. Never before had he allowed himself to be so frank. Jane looked at him thoughtfully. Look, how about when we retire, we do some relaxation and take our minds off these stresses, she suggested. Steve thought about it and smiled a little. That sounds like fun. 
Maybe that would be our reward after all the hardship, he replied. I'm just running out of reports at work. I'm tired as a dog, said Jane. Steve, not much of a drinker, felt that he didn't feel like going home. Then he suggested, let's go to my place then. I have everything the soul wants in my bar. Steve had not expected such a turn of events on his part. He thought that they would just sit somewhere on neutral territory. And then Jane offered him to come to her house. He realized how such a sit-down could end. Suddenly, he was overcome with a fever, and images of Jane on lush sheets with a glass of champagne in her hands came into his mind. In a hoarse voice, he replied, Come on, you. Why not? That night turned everything over in Steve's mind and made him rethink his attitudes and expectations. Jane very subtly and discreetly showed Steve that his self-indulgence was pointless. Think to yourself, what's your fault? You don't have any genetic abnormality. There are no people in your lineage with this condition. Why do you have to suffer your whole life? Don't you think it's unfair? You earn, you could live a very good life, she said. Steve listened to her words carefully, realizing that she was right. Maybe he really should reconsider his situation and find ways to live a full and happy life instead of being tormented all the time. I'm sorry though, it's none of my business. Let's have a drink instead, Steve said. They had a drink and then Jane put on some beautiful music and asked him to dance. It had been a long time since he danced, a long time since he felt such a romantic setting. But by morning, he promised himself it wouldn't happen again. Back home quietly, Steve could smell the medicine that was everywhere and made everything so gray and sad. He went to the kitchen and opened the refrigerator, but there was nothing special in there because everything was subject to austerity. A week later, Jane called him. Steve didn't know where she got his number from, but he was glad she called. Steve, hi, I don't know how you're going to take my offer, she said. Anyway, it's my birthday tomorrow. It's not a round date, so no celebration. Thought, thought, thought about who I'd enjoy sitting with. And you know, decided that only with you and I want to see no one else in my house. Was he pleased? He had long since forgotten that Jane was unpleasant, that Jane was angry and jealous. And anyway, what was Jane like now? And what's his Cynthia like? Heaven and earth. And even if Steve gets smashed to bits, he won't change a thing. I mean, not at all. Ah, uh, Jane, I'd love to, Steve. But if you're talking about presents, please don't even think about it. I understand. In fact, I think we need to find a way out of this situation. Well, there has to be. They always say there's only one way out of one situation, and this isn't it. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. What time would be best for you? Can you get an hour early so you can be at my place at six? Steve squeezed his eyes shut. What is he doing? Then he asked decisively, Jane, can you at least tell me what kind of flowers you like? She laughed. I like roses, as all women do. Steve almost blurted out that, for example, his Cindy only adores chrysanthemums. All then, yes, tomorrow since that birthday party something clicked in Steve's head. He didn't want to go home. He didn't want to live like that anymore. He wanted to live well, the way a professional of his caliber deserved. It had taken him a long time to come to this decision. Even though Jane had urged him to move almost immediately, maybe he'd still be hesitant. But then Cindy started talking to him. How'd she get him to do all the posts? And when she caught him up, he just wouldn't shift that unpleasant conversation again. What was the point of putting up with it? He said everything to her, everything that was on his mind. Everything had almost been ruined by that drawing, the one he once found on the balcony and something stirred in his soul. It made him want to cry. I went to bed feeling upset. By morning, I decided I had to end things with Jane after all. She'd sent him a list of hot tours this morning, he hasn't been to the seaside in 1,000 years. It's so tempting. The vacation at work was no problem. Steve, of course you should go. Don't we get it? You haven't been on vacation in five years. Don't worry, we're gonna support your department. So you'll be back. You'll be fine. How's yours? His boss looked at him sympathetically. What could he tell him about leaving them? Well, of course he couldn't. He shrugged. Nothing new. All right, go on. I won't keep you. Take a break from the hubris. Realizing, though, that a whole different position awaits you after your vacation. It's a good thing you're on vacation. You'll be up and running again. He recounted the conversation to Jane, 
leaving out the line about his family. Jane rubbed her hands together. But life is getting better. I'll have to get you a decent car first. Your junker's been asking for a scrap for a long time. Then we can expand our place. Steve was lying on the couch believing that's the way it was gonna be. How could it not? He was a free man now. The vacation at the sea was unforgettable. Steve never once had the urge to call to see how Lily or Cindy were doing. And Jane never left a minute to spare. She'd take him on a field trip to his room to the beach. He's tan. He's beautiful. Jane would lie next to him at night and say, You're so, you're so handsome. You're so strong. You're the best. And he believed it was true. He went to work with pleasure. First of all, he had a good rest. Secondly, he realized that very soon he would become not the head of the department, but the head of the whole division. And this is quite different. Even cars will be allocated to him. And not just any cars, but good ones. His company's cars are all fire. Having greeted the guard, he went straight to the office of the chief to hand over souvenirs from the sea. Good morning, Konstantin Igorovich, Steve greeted. The chief slowly turned from the window. Hello, Steve Andrivich. How was your rest? Very well. Here are some souvenirs I brought you. The chief looked at Steve strangely. He even became uncomfortable under that gaze. And I brought my daughter some too. Steve stopped smiling. Well, what did he want? Sooner or later everyone was bound to find out, and he was mentally preparing for it. What's the daughter got to do with it? What she got to do with it? Eh, hey, Steve. I've been working with people for so many years, and I would never have thought you were even capable of something like this. Steve hummed. But you can't judge anything because you don't know anything. I'm sorry. I have to go to work. The supervisor gave him an attentive look and shook his head. Clearly some woman wasn't left out. He chatted with Cindy a few times, and he liked her. A beautiful, quiet woman, strong in spirit, and Steve was just furious. Who gave them the right to meddle in his private life? Who? What did they even know about his life? He slumped into his chair. The only thing separating him, as head of the department, from the rest of the employees was a glass partition. Several times he took a break from his papers and realized that his colleagues were looking at him and obviously talking about him. So everyone here was aware of it too. But the most unpleasant thing that day was not the slanted glances, not the conversation with his boss, when he came to the cafe on the first floor to have lunch. People parted to let him through to the cash register. He hummed, wow respect. They know he's going to be the boss soon. He put everything he'd chosen on the tray paid and headed for his favorite table by the window. There were only two women sitting on one side of the table, seemingly from a neighboring department. Enjoy your meal, he set down his tray and sat down. The women silently took their trays and moved to another table. Steve poured himself a fury. The first thing he would do when he became boss was fire these two chickens who stuck their noses where they didn't belong. And a week later, something happened that Steve certainly didn't expect. A general meeting was called throughout the office. Steve showed up that day in a suit and a white shirt. He was well aware that he would be assigned to a new position today. Jane at home gave him a fastidious look and was pleased. You look great. I like it a lot. After lunch, all the people stretched out to the hall. Steve went too. He sat in the front row where the other department heads sat. For the last time now, he would always sit at the table on the stage. His boss, Constantine, lowered himself down next to him. He silently listened to everything that was being broadcast from the stage. Then Steve heard something that jolted him, and he quickly stood up, turning out to be the new head of the department. Some woman had been appointed. A second later, he headed for the exit with a swift step. An hour later, when everyone was back, including Constantine, Steve headed to his office. Can you explain to me what that was about? I thought you said I was going to be the boss, he asked. The warden looked at him and calmly replied. We all consulted and decided that such a serious post could not be headed by a man without principles. The man is a traitor. My God, what kind of nonsense are you talking about? One thousand people get divorced. One thousand leave their families. Maybe. But in such a situation, what do you know about it? Have you lived in that kind of hell? You haven't? It's not for you to judge. Steve said indignantly. 
The warden took off his glasses, rubbed the bridge of his nose. And how do you know about the others? I have a son with cerebral palsy and his mom wanted an easy life just like you. No problems, but it's okay, we're doing fine. And by your logic, I should have put him in a boarding school immediately. In that case, I should probably quit, said the boss. Steve already regretted his words. Suddenly, Constantin would say, yeah, what's he supposed to do then? You know, that's not a bad idea. Anyway, you won't get any more support from me, he continued. In the evening, Jane was long gone from work. Steve himself didn't know why he was so worried. Well, he quit. That was fine. There would always be a job for a specialist like him. He would tomorrow. Jane arrived just after midnight, smelling faintly of champagne. Oh, what are you doing up? Where have you been? Jane looked at him in surprise. What's with the tone? It's a normal tone. I was wondering where my woman has been. Actually, it's going to be morning soon. But first of all, I'm not your woman. Serfdom was abolished long ago. And secondly, what kind of snobbery is this? I'm not going to answer to you for every move I make. We're adults. We have friends, girlfriends, Jane replied irritably. Steve realized it was time to tone it down. But you could have called. I could have, but I forgot, he said, gritting his teeth. She forgot. He called a hundred times. First, she hung up on him. Then she just turned the phone off, Steve thought. I've got news, he said to Jane, raising his hands. That's it, tomorrow. I'm insanely tired. He silently followed her into the bedroom, but Jane collapsed so that there was no room for him on the bed. He had to go back to the living room and make himself comfortable on the short sofa. He lay awake for a long time, staring at the ceiling, thinking. He was hired. The salary wasn't that good, though. Jane was terribly displeased. We should. Cindy should be disenfranchised so she doesn't run around complaining, she said. What makes you think it's her? Who else? Even if it wasn't her, it's still her doing it, Steve objected. There, I told you. They're just poisoning your life. By the way, did you file the divorce papers? A few years later, Jane was fired for a big shortfall. The whole debt was pinned on her. And Steve suddenly realized he was right back where he left off. Only there was the kid and here was Jane. Just like that. All the money was going into the abyss. Jane was paying off debt to stay out of jail. And Steve was working. Jane couldn't because she was getting less than the principal. She didn't agree. Principal positions are being snapped up very quickly. One evening on his way home, Steve turned down a familiar street, stopped under the windows, stood looking at the glowing windows. It felt so nasty, so bad. I wanted to get up and say what a fool he was to be forgiven. I wanted to look at his daughter's drawings. Steve, are you? He jerked around. Standing next to the car was a neighbor, a grandmother, from the first floor. Hello, yeah me. Haven't seen you in a while. You're just standing there for nothing. Your family left, sold the apartment, and went somewhere very far away. You have to take an airplane. Over there, to another country. How did they leave? Why? Lily's not allowed. But that wasn't reported to me. Grandma said, gone it seemed, to live quite somewhere in Italy. He couldn't understand what was going on. Grandma didn't usually mix things up. She had always been judicious. But if this was true, it turned out to be an unwise decision. The doctors had warned that any trip, any flight, could be Lily's last. The risk of her heart valve failing was too great. Cindy couldn't volunteer for such a thing. Unless, unless she too decided to make it easier on herself. But no, Cindy was definitely not capable of that. He drove out of the yard, thought about calling Cindy's mother, but then decided he'd better not. Now, at least... He could live in peace. But life still wasn't working out. Everything was going wrong. Jane got a job as a bookkeeper at some firm and was making sense. The firm where Steve worked was bought out and recruited young employees. He was offered to stay on as an errand boy or quit. Now he was earning money with some odd jobs. Everything was going wrong. The car was his only asset from the past when he was at his peak. He and Jane had managed to buy their car. Jane sold it as soon as she got into debt. Today, he came in with another job. There was an urge to have a beer and just sleep. But Jane had other plans for him. What are you doing? Giving up? 
What's the big deal? I'm actually tired. Do you watch the news at all? There's an exhibition of an artist from abroad starting in our town today. She's very talented, but that's not what I mean. The bros were saying today that the city is flooded with foreigners. Cab drivers must be making a lot of money these days. How about tomorrow? It's kind of a holiday for you and me today, Jane said. Steve looked longingly at the two bottles of beer. Maybe tomorrow, he thought. It's kind of a holiday with you and me today. A holiday? What kind of holiday? But I left you 10 years ago. But I wouldn't call it a holiday. Personally, I'd had nothing but bad luck since you left. So, is it okay that you ruined my family? Who needs you? Should I have lured you in with a finger? You didn't have to. You just dropped everything and came running. Even a sick kid didn't stop him. What a man, Jane continued. Steve jumped up, fists clenched. You what, you? He asked. Are you going to hit me? Come on. He stood there, unmoving. Well, here you can't even do that. You can't do anything at all. Steve walked silently toward the door. A little more and he would hit her. He thought it was all her fault. It was just that she had fallen at a time when he was having doubts. Another would have backed him up. It was all her and only her. Steve stopped to smoke next to the mall. On the wall, he saw a large poster. Nika is a young talent. The exhibition was at the House of Culture. I wondered what she was doing here. Well, it's not the biggest city, but it's not small either. Why did she come here? Steve learned that foreigners had come to town to buy the paintings that were on display. They paid well and left tips. The foreigners attracted a lot of cab drivers. The closing of the exhibition was near. I'm eating now. I'll go too, Steve thought. Though he earned a very good salary today, the mustachioed cab driver got into a broken down Shiguli and sank from his seat. Steve pulled out of the parking lot. It was almost an hour until seven. During that time, he had time to drive around the city 10 times, but there was no work. Who was coming from work was already home and who was going for a walk. Back home, near the House of Culture, there were many cars, all expensive and beautiful. Cavs stretched along the edge of the parking lot. One car caught his eye, a white Jeep. Steve did not even immediately realize what brand it was. He got out of the car, walked the machine around. Yes, not bad. I wonder how much it cost. He stood for a while longer, then got into his car. How come he fell asleep? Steve still didn't understand. Apparently, fatigue had taken its toll. He picked up the phone, which had already rung several times. Steve, why are you picking up the phone? This is the third time I'm calling. Can't you hear me? Where are you? Is there some voice behind you? Steve shifted the receiver away from his ear and was silent for a long time. Yeah, it's nothing. You imagined it. I was just quiet for a long time, he said, waving away the feeling of strangeness. Okay, well, I thought you weren't working then. I am. I'm working. I'm working, Steve replied. Anyway, when you go home... Get some sour cream and herring. Steve wanted to ask where he was going to get the money for that, but he held back in time. It was like he was working, not sleeping. Do you understand me? Jane continued. He didn't answer, just stared out the car window at the street. Suddenly he saw a woman and time froze. It was Cindy. There was no doubt about it. She was so beautiful, so fashionable. It was like he fell out of reality. It was like it was 10 years ago but she looked even better than when he left her. Steve, can you hear me? Hello? Jane's voice reached him. Yeah, what's the connection? What are we just paying money for? Steve replied angrily. The phone dropped to the seat and Steve jumped out of the car. Cindy, a woman who had been walking too slowly, stopped, looked at Steve, and her eyes widened in surprise. Steve? Yes, it's me. What's not to recognize? You look beautiful, he said. Cindy's eyes went cold. Yeah, well, I didn't recognize you right away. Thanks, I know. Steve felt confused. How's life, Cindy? Everything okay? He asked. How's Lily? It was at this point that he realized he had done a huge stupid thing. Why was he asking about Lily? Although, on the other hand, Lily is his daughter. There's nothing wrong with Lily either, she said. Steve tried to correct his inappropriate phrasing. He was surprised, and apparently he did it too obviously. 
but did a young and girlish voice speak from somewhere off to the side here? You're not going to believe this, Daddy. Contrary to your best efforts, I'm not dead, came the voice. Steve turned sharply. Standing next to him was a young girl. Yes, he recognized her immediately. It was his daughter, Lily. Behind her stood a man a little older than Steve himself, looking at him unkindly. Why did you do that, Lily? I meant you no harm, said Steve. The girl laughed. You didn't? You didn't mean us or me any harm when you left us with no money, knowing how much the medicine cost. You knew perfectly well that without them I might die. Mom kept it a secret, but I heard what you told her before you left. But it didn't seem like your life was any better with Alice. Lily continued. Steve was stunned. What kind of trials had his mom gone through while he was taking a break from him? If it wasn't for Daddy Rick, they wouldn't be talking right now. For his and Grandpa's sake, I was able to return to my hometown for my exhibition. Steve stood silent for a moment. Then he asked, so is that you, the young artist Nika? I took a swipe at you right there? Yes, Daddy. Now if only you had the money and had the kind of life you want. Or, uh, no, you wouldn't. You're just not capable of doing things like Daddy Rick. You know, he almost went to jail because he forced the pilots of a private plane to land near a hospital. Otherwise, I wouldn't have survived. Would you have? No, Daddy, you wouldn't have been able to do anything because you run away from difficulties and problems instead of solving them, Lally said. The man who was standing next to her put his hand on her shoulder. That's enough, calm down. Daughter, let's go to the car, he said. Cindy looked at Steve thoughtfully. But I'm not going to ask how you're living. I can see that already. Goodbye, Steve. Steve was just about to reply something when he heard Jane's exasperated scream. Steve, wait, don't go. Jesus, she was just home, Jane yelled. Maybe she wasn't calling from home. Jane ran up, out of breath, and shoved Steve's bag. Oh, it'll get me home, cause I'm so tired, she said. Cindy, who was already walking toward the car, stopped abruptly. She slowly turned around and stared at Steve's wife. Jane also turned and stared perplexedly at Cindy for a while and then, apparently recognizing her, froze. So that's who spurred my husband to a better life? Cindy whispered. A smile appeared on her face. Jane, how much gold did you not wish for? I guess Steve only needed you to bite me harder too. There was no way I could have guessed it was you. But I guess you're lucky, not for long. You know how people fall from heights? I wouldn't be wrong. You buried your daughter, Jane said. What kind of bitch are you, Jane? Steve exploded. No, my daughter is alive and well, and as you can see, quite successful, Cindy said, turning back to her family. Jane threw a quick glance at the poster and wrinkled her nose like a toothache. Still something of an act, she muttered. But you've been decked out in expensive clothes because of the daughter on the bill. So what? So what you haven't had is happiness, and you'll never have simple family happiness. Jane looked at her triumphantly. At that moment, Rick came out of the car again. Cindy, how much longer? You know our son will be very unhappy if you keep waiting for him much longer. He might even throw toys, he said. Cindy looked at Rick with loving eyes. Yeah, you're right. Let's go, she replied. She turned to Jane and Steve. So, goodbye then. Advice and love, she said. They walked to the car. Steve tried to follow her. Igor turned around and said, not good. Steve looked at her and shook his head negatively. The car pulled out of the parking lot and they stood there looking after it. Suddenly, Jane's face reflected anger. Cindy, well, that's okay. You'll cry at my place. Steve, you should sue your daughter for child support. She has so much money and you're stretched thin on bread and water. I know people. We'll get you on disability and she'll pay like a sweetheart she said with obvious anger in her voice. Steve turned away, realizing that further conversation with Jane would only lead to more problems. He stepped back inside. Only one thing was clear. He had a lot of difficult decisions in front of him and a fight for his happiness. He turned to Jane and told her that if she didn't want to become an invalid herself, she'd better shut up. What's that? What are you going to do? A loser? She asked indignantly. Steve hit the woman for the first time in his life. Not very hard, just slapped her on the lips and walked to the car. Jane screamed all the way down the street, 
but no one came to help because no one was around. She rushed after him. Steve, stop. What's the matter with you? Don't you want a good life? But think to yourself how much we could sue her for so much money that she wouldn't even notice, Jane shouted, but Steve wasn't listening. He was absorbed in his own thoughts and sped off. Jane managed to jump into the car at the last second and Steve sped forward. His wife kept talking about something, but he couldn't hear. He had no thoughts in his head. A big white car parked in front of a beautiful house. Well, here we are home. Tired, Lily? The girl looked at Rick appreciatively. No, Dad Rick, I'm fine. Let's go already. I can only imagine how Joe has tortured Grandpa. They went in, but the house was quiet. That's odd. Actually, they thought Grandpa was already out of it and his four-year-old grandson had turned the whole house upside down. Rick peeked into the room. Dad then turned to them and pointed his finger into the room, then pressed it to his lips. Cindy and Lily looked into the room and laughed quietly. The grandfather and grandson were sleeping right on the fluffy rug by the fireplace. Grandpa had a toy bow in his hands and so did Joe. Apparently, they had been running around so much that they had both played and fallen asleep. Papa, well, the doctor told you not to strain your body, said Rick. Who asked him to strain it? What, I can't play war games now. Joe woke up too, looked at them and rushed over to Lily. But dad and mom let themselves be kissed too. Soon the whole family was sitting around the big holiday table. Lily was pensive. Cindy stroked her arm. So are you upset? She asked. No, mom, I think I'm even relieved. I wanted to get back at him so badly. Today, I realized that he got his own revenge. Life punished him, Lily replied. Cindy pulled her daughter close to her. That's good. You should never take revenge. Life will sort things out. Mark raised his glass. I propose we drink to Lily's success. It's a resounding success. And I will say, as an expert on the subject, that there's more to come. Thank you, Gramps, Lily said. Not five minutes later, Mark raised his glass again. Now I'd like to drink to your return. Native people should live together and, of course, in the homeland. Another five minutes later, another glass again. An hour later, Lily and Rick led Grandpa into the bedroom. Rick asked in surprise, Dad, and what was that? You've never let yourself do that before. Mark stopped and said, Son, if you only knew how glad I am to have you back, you don't realize how lonely I was out here, the old man said. Rick looked at him in surprise. But you never said anything. Should I have? Mark asked. No, I didn't want to interfere with your life, replied the old man and went straight to sleep. Lily said, how he suffered and why didn't we come back sooner? Rick hugged her and said, nothing. We'll all have a life together now. You'll paint. Mommy will plant flowers like she wanted. Daddy will help her. He's a beauty lover too. I will finally take over the firm that is located in this town. Lily brushed away tears. Joe will go to daycare. He's going to fight and hurt the teachers there. And we'll be scolded and called to the superintendent's office all the time. And we'll set up a line and take our turns at it. We'll see who gives him the fastest, said Lily, laughing and adding. Come on, Mom must have lost us. They walked out into the living room and saw Cindy and Marie sitting on the couch. Cindy was looking at an album in amazement. In that sketchbook, Joe was drawing all the time. Mom, what's wrong with your face? Nick asks. The girl looks in the album, takes a long look and then laughs. Congratulations, there's one more artist in the family. They laugh and hug. Joe, seeing such a scene, begins to cry. The whole family immediately rushes to comfort him. Cindy looks at her loved ones and realizes that for the sake of such a day, she is ready to go through everything she has already experienced. What matters is the bottom line. And in the end, they are all happy. Tim belonged to that category of people for whom personal image was paramount. Throughout his not very long life, he repeatedly made a stunning impression on others. And to achieve this high goal, the average entrepreneur used not only known, but even forbidden techniques. In other words, Tim did not disdain any tricks. Unfortunately, Lucy, Lucy, late businessman, did not immediately realize with what a difficult man she decided to tie her fate many years ago. For almost 12 years of marriage, the woman has regretted it more than once. 
In moments of despair, she even mentally cursed the day when she met the businessman. Even now, when the burden of the theft suddenly fell on her shoulders, she sent her late husband only warm words. Though the young woman didn't really believe in telepathy, she relied on the power of her numerical message. Staring with a wandering gaze at her husband's portrait in a morning frame, she sent him impulse after impulse. Well, Tim, have you had enough? Did you think that like a fairy tale hero, you could run away from everyone and hide? But it didn't work out. This time, life set a trap for you. Could you have imagined that you would be killed by a stupid accident in the prime of your life? You must have planned a beautiful exit from this earthly life. And then you took a banal turn, a dumpster, two fighting bums, and the proverbial banana peel. It was the latter that played the fatal role. Tim had no idea that something inevitable would happen to him in a minute. When he was awakened in the middle of the night by a late night phone call from his wife. Lucy, I'm sorry if I woke you, but I'm here. I'll have to leave the car in the yard because I have to get up at six o'clock tomorrow. Suddenly, the animated tone was replaced by surprise. What is this outrage? And guys, stop it. This harsh remark obviously did not apply to this Lucy, so Lucy got worried and asked, Tim, what's going on over there? Who are you yelling at? Oh, nothing much. The local bums are sorting it out. Wait, I'll go. I'll explain everything to them. The woman shouted into the phone, asking her husband not to interfere in someone else's squabbles but he couldn't hear her anymore because he went to clean up. The man did not turn off his cell phone and she heard the car door slam first and then muffled shouts were heard. Stop hitting each other. We don't know what happened. I'm going to call the police now if you don't calm down. Her husband's voice, which brought other sounds to her. Then everything suddenly went silent. The woman screamed into the receiver for several minutes. Tim, Tim, where are you? What's going on out there? Since there was no response, Lucy went downstairs. The elderly concierge looked at her sternly. Where are you going so late? It's almost half past one in the morning. Lucy threw something vague over her shoulder because her heart was already fluttering with a sense of anxiety. She rushed to her husband's car, hoping she still had time to warn him of the danger. The businessman's car stood with the door open. For a few seconds, the woman looked around in panic. Tim, where are you? A suspicious rustle was heard from the side of the garbage dump. She ran up just as the large man's body began to convulse. Lucy rushed over to the injured man. He even tried to smile despite his critical condition. Lucy, be careful with the banana peel. Can you believe I slipped and hit my head on the edge of that metal thing? It's almost a classic situation. The man tried to lift his head, but cried out in pain and stopped. Lucy immediately remembered the first aid algorithm. She told her husband Tim not to move. I'm going to call an ambulance now. Grabbing the cell phone lying on the driver's seat, the woman called an ambulance. The husband gestured for her to bend over. She lowered herself to the ground and took Tim's hand. Hold on, don't go away. The paramedics will be here soon. Just don't pass out, talk to me, he whispered quietly. I'm trying, but I can't. I don't want to go, just like that, without saying goodbye. A series of new convulsions ran through the man's body and he stopped moving. The last thing the husband said was, Lucy, I'm sorry for everything that's happened. What's in store for you? Call and go where? Lucy still held his strong hand. An ambulance siren wailed in the distance, but it was too late. Tim had died honorably and ignominiously by the garbage cans. The paramedics diagnosed an open head injury and called the police to the scene. When law enforcement officers arrived, Lucy had not yet fully realized what had happened. She recounted the events of the last 20 minutes in detail, stumbling over every phrase. The policeman, as if summarizing, asked, So, apart from you, are there any other witnesses to what happened? The woman did not have time to answer this question, as something suspiciously stirred behind the garbage cans. One of the operatives rushed to the container and pulled out a frightened homeless man. Here's our comrade, Captain. We're incredibly lucky. We have one witness. The policeman couldn't resist. Only he stinks so badly you can't breathe. The homeless man raised his head proudly. Gentlemen, everything in this world is relative. And what smells bad today may become a trend or a flavor tomorrow. While everyone present tried to understand the depth of meaning of this phrase, the homeless man gained confidence. 
We want to make ourselves known. The captain came to life. And who are we? You weren't here alone. Sure, we were with Max, doing our evening rounds and arguing a little. When this guy showed up. Who's Max? Homeless guy's got his shoulders back in the air. This is my partner. He turned to the trash cans and made an expressive gesture with his right hand. Max, come out. Let's tell it like it was. Or, I mean, the police might think we killed the body. And we don't want that. We're honest citizens. We didn't plan any of this. The partner, a talkative homeless man, timidly crawled out of his hiding place. For about five minutes, he listed his worthy qualities while remaining a witness. And only after the presentation began to tell about what had happened. Yes, it was the boy's own fault. It's freezing in the evening and it's just slippery here. A man in women's shoes suddenly got behind the wheel and crashed. He had the nerve to tilt the container over his head with all his might. Max and I heard his skull crack. Max confirmed it. The typical bum's partner just nodded his head and continued his story. We knew right away that something smelled like kerosene. A long time ago, I worked as a janitor in a hospital, so I saw some horrors there. We used to get barrels like this man's. We wanted to call 103, but we couldn't because this woman showed up. Of course, Lucy in those difficult moments was not up to the testimony of two homeless people. She continued to sit next to her husband, not paying attention to the cold and strangers. The ambulance paramedic gave her an injection, and the concierge quickly helped her get to the apartment. She kept telling her to cry, that it would make her feel better. But everything inside Lucy was petrified. She could neither cry nor scream, although the tragedy had happened less than two days ago. It seemed to her as if an eternity had passed. She sat by the coffin, emitting a bitter spirit. Suddenly, she felt someone push her. She looked at her husband's portrait and shuddered. It seemed to her that her husband's eyes in the portrait twitched. She felt sick for a moment and quickly looked away from the portrait, where Ariana stood with a mournful face. First, Lucy Tim. She caught her gaze and whispered distinctly, obviously hoping for the attention of the audience. Hold on, dear Lucy, and don't forget that you are not alone in this difficult moment. A bitter tear glistened in Arian's eyes but she quickly brushed it away with a polished gesture. Lucy smiled to herself and thought without anger. Ariana in her usual role. Even from the funeral of her ex-husband, she managed to create a colorful show. And the young woman was not mistaken in her assumptions. After all, it was the first Lucy who organized a solemn farewell in the house of Folkart. The presence of a large group of journalists was also her initiative. However, Ariana did not find it necessary to consult with her on this matter. Simply that same evening, after Lucy's call, she firmly stated, Lucy, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. The girl didn't immediately understand what she was talking about. I don't quite understand you. A disgruntled sigh followed. What's so difficult about it? We both had a loved one die, which means we need to take care of Tim's funeral. So I've decided to take charge of organizing that event since you've apparently never done anything like this before, so I thought I'd lighten your burden a little. Lucy was uncomfortable with this woman's interference, and she even tried to respond to her with rudeness. Ariana, I appreciate your help, but it is not always appropriate. In this case, it is definitely against common sense. As Lucy's legal guardian, it's my responsibility to take care of everything. Ariana laughed into the receiver, and Lucy's ears rang painfully. Darlings, Let's not cross swords at such a sorrowful moment. I'll tell you more, now that the reason for our opposition has itself fallen away, we might become friends. Think over my offer and do not be in a hurry to refuse. The conversation was unpleasant to the young widow and to get rid of the intrusive counselor, she answered in a colorless voice. All right, I'll think it over. See you later. Oh, I almost forgot. Tim's farewell will take place at the house of Folkart. A wave of indignation swept through Lucy's mind again. I think a more modest procedure would have sufficed. I can only imagine how much this setting would cost us. Ariana laughed again, but this time it was a sinister laugh that sent venomous goosebumps running down the young woman's spine. Lucy, you're so made. I told you I'm taking over the funeral arrangements, which means the hall rental and other expenses are on my conscience too. Lucy couldn't help herself. I wonder why the sudden generosity and Ariana wasn't laughing anymore. There was a note of regret in her voice 
much to Tim's surprise. Unfortunately, I'm not altruistic. Tim has spoiled a lot of blood for me in his time. But there is one circumstance that got me involved in the process. But I don't think this is the best time to discuss the matter. The hour will come, and you will know everything. Lucy sat at the headboard of her husband's funeral bed and reflected on the events of the last two days. But strangely enough, she was most concerned about Arian's behavior. This woman repeatedly intruded into their life together, without asking and without observing the basic rules of decency. But no matter how hard Lucy tried, she could not contain this insolent woman. When Ariana carelessly hinted that Lucy was experiencing the loss of a loved one for the first time in her life, she was a hundred times wrong. The recently widowed woman was only three and a half years old when she was orphaned. Lucy's parents, young doctors, decided to devote their long-awaited vacation to a sea voyage. They left their daughter in the care of her grandmother, who was strongly opposed to this kind of vacation. Why drag a child on a cruise ship? Who knows what kind of storms there might be? And Lucy would suffer from seasickness. Carlos thought his mother's fears were unfounded. Mom, why do you always make such a big deal out of everything? Many families with small children go on sea cruises and have pleasant experiences, and all you see is horror and danger, as if she had a premonition that something bad was going to happen. As you wish, but I'm not giving you my granddaughter. Let her stay with me, then my heart will be at peace. The couple had to accept this ultimatum, but it was obvious that the decision of the grandmother pleased them very much. Overheard her son said to his future daughter-in-law Naomi, we have the unique opportunity to relive our honeymoon. At that moment, the old woman only smiled and thought that she was ready for anything, as long as her children were happy. The young couple should have already returned from the trip, when the country spread the terrible news that a few kilometers from the coast wrecked the ship Admiral did not want to believe such terrible rumors. She hoped that this is just another hoax. But soon the news of the terrible tragedy was confirmed. Grandmother did not say anything to the little granddaughter because she was sure that her son and daughter-in-law are all right and they somehow survived. After all, their names were not on the list of the dead. They were considered missing. But as the days went by, no miracle happened. Despite her young age, Lucy vividly remembered the day she learned she no longer had a father and mother. It was September 1, and the town where her grandmother lived was celebrating the beginning of the school year with great enthusiasm. Explain to the excited girl, Don't worry, Lucy. Time flies. In three years, you two will go to first grade for the first time. And Mommy and Daddy will accompany you. During the day, they did not yet know about the tragedy. It became known in the evening when the holiday was over and the wind scattered candy wrappers and burst balloons around the city. And there was a certain symbolism to it that Lucy realized later. Then, throughout her life, these innocent attributes of the holiday caused her unpleasant memories. She could not get used to the fact that she no longer had a father and mother. On long winter evenings, the girl sat at the window and asked a good fairy, please let my mom and dad come back. They didn't do anything wrong. They healed people. The girl believed in her grandmother's fairy tale that her parents had been bewitched by an evil wizard, so she asked the fairy to free them from the charms of the evil sorcerer. Watched this scene with tears in her eyes, but could not bring herself to destroy the hopes of the little granddaughter. After all, she was her best friend, woman, and colleague at work. One day, she admonished her. You shouldn't do that. The girl might go crazy. Tell her Carlos and Naomi are dead. Angelica replied. I can't do that. I can't destroy the child's hopes. I still believe they are alive. But that's just self-deception. Oh well, so be it. It's easier this way. The grandmother gained custody of her granddaughter, even though Naomi's parents were against it. The bride's relatives blamed Carlos for everything that happened, and the old woman was terribly afraid that they would instill this theory into the still fragile consciousness of her granddaughter. The case even came to court but in favor of the fact that she was much younger than Naomi's parents. Another strong argument was her science degree and increased benefits. Naomi's parents were simple laborers and earned little. Therefore, the court decided that it could provide its only granddaughter with a better standard of living. Since the case was decided not in their favor, the bride's parents severed all relations with. Only years later, when Lucy grew up, she visited them. 
and it was her grandmother who insisted on this visit. But she started the conversation from afar. Lucy, you know that you also have grandparents, right? The girl was very surprised at this familiarity. Of course I know. There are lots of pictures of them in the album, but you said they don't want to know about us. The older woman looked embarrassed. It's not that simple. When Carlos and Naomi died tragically, there was a misunderstanding between us and we stopped communicating. Lucy interrupted her grandmother. But I'm at the age where I can say anything. It's not hard to guess that the two clans blamed each other for what happened. I'm right. The Trophimus had to admit their granddaughter was right. Yes, you're almost right. Naomi's parents blamed Carlos, your dad. They even tried to take you away from me. We even went to court. How awful. Turning a child into a trophy, nothing more horrible and humiliating asked in a trembling voice. Are you angry with me? I may have acted unjustly, but at that moment this decision seemed to me the only right thing to do. The girl looked at her grandmother who was ready to burst into tears and say something stupid. You are my dearest person in the entire universe. She hugged the elderly woman and then comforted her for a long time. Grandma, please don't cry. I realize that your actions were motivated by a desire to protect me. Perhaps if I were you, I would have done the same thing. I promise I'll come visit Grandpa Anthony and Grandma Nancy very soon. I just need to finish my exams and then I'll visit them. Lucy had long been concerned about her relatives and she was anxious to rebuild the broken bridges for that purpose. The time of the student vacation was just right. And Lucy even worked extra practice hours so that nothing would interfere with her plans. After the death of her daughter, Naomi's parents moved to the village, where they settled in the ancestral home of Anthony's grandfather. In their lifestyle, the elderly couple found solace and attended church every Sunday. Lucy appeared unexpectedly, and the old people considered it a miracle. Grandmother Nancy fussed minute by minute around her guest. Lucy, you don't know how happy Grandpa Anthony and I are. We saw you when you were very little. Grandpa Anthony nodded in agreement and sun bunnies danced in his eyes. Yes, you were very little. You probably don't remember us, do you? The girl saw hope in the old man's eyes for the first time in her life and lied. No, no, I remember us coming to visit you. Only you didn't live in the village then, but in the city. You're right, he said. We had an apartment, but then we sold it. The man grew sad, but after a moment his eyes lit up again. Lucy... Do you remember Sarah? The girl froze in amazement, trying to figure out what her grandfather was talking about. Apparently, Grandma Nancy realized that her granddaughter was afraid of offending them and came to her rescue. By the way, that wooden horse was making a lot of noise. We almost got into a fight with the downstairs neighbors. There were hours of rocking on rocking horses, and this amusement was accompanied by a strong knocking noise. From the grandparents, the girl learned many interesting details from her early childhood. Lucy spent almost a whole month in the village, and it was the most wonderful time of her life, which she always remembered with nostalgia. When it was time to leave, the old people tearfully said goodbye to their granddaughter. Lucy, don't forget about us. You can't even imagine what your arrival means to us. You showed up, and we took another deep breath. The girl made a solemn promise to her relatives. You won't get a break from me before I come to visit you again. Unfortunately, the life of medical students is such that they do not know what tomorrow will bring. Lucy diligently kept in touch with the old people. She called them every week, wrote them affectionate letters. But for two years, there had been no opportunity to visit them in person. The opportune moment came unexpectedly when the girl was practicing before receiving her diploma. In those years in small settlements, there was an acute shortage of specialists, so the university administration decided to take an active part in solving this social problem. Future doctors were gathered in the assembly hall, and the dean himself made the following statement. Dear colleagues, yes, yes, today I address you as equals, and you have proved that you deserve such treatment. I hope that the professional fire that burns, not smolders in your hearts, will inspire you to new feats for the sake of people's lives. Usually the dean's speeches were shorter and more modest, but here he was so blatantly pompous. The young audience was surprised, and everyone waited impatiently for the dean to finish his speech. But the director's enthusiasm quickly waned, and in the final part, he simply but lucidly addressed everyone. 
Guys, you know that in medicine, as in the army, what the command orders must be carried out without discussion. Today, there is a very tense situation with the availability of medical services in small settlements. Therefore, you will have to practice in rural areas and district hospitals. The hall immediately buzzed, and the dean lost the opportunity to reach the consciousness of the students. Many classmates openly expressed their indignation at this decision. Others were silently digesting the news, while still others were considering their options. How to escape? This is another commitment. There was another group of students to which Lucy belonged. The girl calmly accepted the prospect of becoming a village doctor. Right after the meeting, she walked into the office and said, Send me to Colorado. I know for a fact that there is no doctor there, only one paramedic. The woman tasked with assigning students to practice sites was surprised. It's nice that we haven't run out of volunteers. It's commendable that you came on your own. And by the way, you're the first. But don't get too carried away, girl. Because there are cases when students first beat their chests and swear that they are ready for any hardship. And then come here in tears and ask to be transferred to a more comfortable workplace. Lucy assured the woman. Don't worry, I won't cry and complain. The woman looked at her again with an attentive gaze and entered the necessary information into her list. Having received a referral to the regional office of the Ministry of Health, Lucy began to prepare for the trip. She decided to surprise her relatives and did not inform them of her imminent arrival. I must say that the surprise turned out to be very impressive. When Lucy appeared on the threshold of the apartment with two suitcases, her grandmother grabbed her heart and burst into tears. My little girl, something's happened. You were expelled from the university? The girl realized that she had made an unforgivable mistake by putting her grandmother's health under stress. She tried to correct this mistake. Grandma, it's okay. I was not expelled. I'm here for my internship. Lucy froze, hoping to make her grandmother laugh, but she was still in shock and looked reproachfully at her granddaughter. How can you scare an elderly person like that? You could have warned her about your coming, for decency. The grandmother walked for a few minutes with a resentful look, helping the guests to distribute things. Then she looked fondly at Lucy, my favorite granddaughter, and I didn't even believe that I would live to see this day. Lucy, as a child, hugged her grandmother and closed her eyes. Lucy, what are you saying? You taught me to believe and not to give up until the end, and I've always followed that code to the letter. Besides, your joy is a little premature, because I'm not here for good. She didn't hide her disappointment. I thought, darling, my internship will last a few months, so we'll have plenty of time to socialize. The old woman cheered up again. Did they send you to our neighborhood hospital? No, grandmother, we have such beauty. The girl hugged Anna Wee again. That is, me and my classmates had the high honor of saving rural medicine. I'm going to Colorado. The situation there is catastrophic. Lucy braced herself for her grandmother's tears, but to her surprise, she was delighted. So it's in the same piece of Pompeii. Does that mean you can stay with Grandpa Anthony and Nancy? I was going to visit them for a month too. It was time for Lucy to be surprised. Wow. Did I miss something? Since when did you two start visiting each other? Friends. The old woman looked meaningfully at her granddaughter and said proudly. And since I sent you to them. You have your own affairs in the capital. You have no time to deal with us old people. And we, by the way, miss you very much and worry about you. In situations like this, it's best to stick together. The saints used to come to my birthday party but now they've invited me to their house. Anthony, in order not to be bored, got busy with the bees. As a doctor, you must know that spring honey is the healthiest, so I agreed to volunteer to be a taster. Maybe I won't die after tasting it. Lucy listened to her grandmother's emotional story and did not understand what puzzled her more, the fact of establishing contacts or the speech filled with village words. She couldn't resist making a remark. Wow, you surprised me. Where did you pick up such expressions? The old woman didn't even bat an eye. And I like it, because every dialect has its own unique verbal expressions. If you want to reveal the genesis of people living in a certain territory. Yes, you got an amazing and incredible mixture of biology and philology, playfully winked at granddaughter Lucy. That's what our people are based on. The girl decided not to enter into unnecessary arguments, and it is unlikely that such a duel would end with her victory.
Perhaps the news of the reconciliation of the two sides was the most joyful of the day. And at the end of the week, Lucy went to the place of her internship, as promised, also moved to the village for the summer. Thus, the elderly relatives created a strong support for their beloved granddaughter. After all, the novice general practitioner had no time even for a quiet lunch. As soon as the local population learned about the appearance of the young doctor at the paramedic station, crowds of sick and just curious citizens flocked here. Lucy did not refuse anyone because she had no moral right to do so. People often knocked on her door in the middle of the night and asked for help on weekends. One Sunday morning in August, Ariana came to her in a luxurious foreign car. From that day on, the girl's life took a sharp turn and the main priorities shifted from public interest to personal ones. Experienced people say that in order to become a real soldier, you need to withstand the first battle with dignity. This military truth finds confirmation in medicine as well. Just for a month of work in the village medical station, Lucy learned a lot of things that she had not even suspected before. But the main conclusion the young doctor made in the first few days, life is not as it is described in textbooks, she had been warned about it by a paramedic who had been carrying the burden of the problems of a rural institution on her shoulders for many years. Perhaps it was that burden that sometimes drove Jacob to drunkenness. On her first day on the job, Lucy smelled the odor of alcohol coming from her older collie. Noticing her grimace, the man said cheerfully, Yes, I know I'm not a very pleasant odor, but that's just a side effect of the previous evening. I don't indulge in strong drinks on weekdays but the smell in the paramedic's office. The girl realized that he celebrates holidays almost every day. Since she was a temporary person in the rural health facilities, she decided to ignore the habit of the older comrade. Jacob started his internship in an unusual way. He decided to talk a little about the works of a great classicist. Lucy, did you notice that I have the same name as a literary genius? Most likely, the man expected the girl to be embarrassed. But she answered without hesitation. Of course, it is impossible to pass by such a similarity indifferently. But despite all the problems that exist today, you are still more fortunate than Michael. Jacob was puzzled. I wonder what that luck is. Everything. You can't deny that today's conditions are much better than they were at the end of the 19th century. The paramedic crossed his arms across his chest. Really, Lucy, you've cracked me up. I can see that you are not only good at medicine, although it is known that the writer also liked to drink and prod. But Michael wasn't prone to excess and always kept to moderation. Jacob raised his hands in surrender. I give up. I can't argue with you. I have to admit that it would be a pleasure to work in tandem with such an intelligent and, moreover, beautiful girl. Throughout her years of study, Lucy had been diligently accumulating knowledge. However, Despite the extensive knowledge she had gained at university, the young specialist felt insecure in her first days. That is why Jacob was always there to support the young doctor in case of difficulties. He spoke several times a day. Don't doubt it, Lucy. I am below your rank, but experience is a great thing. In my field, I can make a diagnosis simply by breathing and pulse. I know everything about every patient. People trust me. I value that trust very much. As the first days of the appointment showed, the paramedic exaggerated these assurances. Visitors flocked, but everyone was eager to get to the young doctor. At first, this nickname in the style of Allah annoyed the girl, but she quickly got used to this treatment. Lucy also got used to the constant absences of her older companion. The first time Jacob asked her, his eyes glittering suspiciously, Lucy, could you cover for me for a couple hours? She answered without hesitation. Sure, do you have any problems? The man was slightly embarrassed and muttered. Yes, there are some domestic difficulties. Well, you mind your own business and I'll handle the reception alone. Are you sure we won't have an inspection today? Not a week later, Jacob made the same request again, but this time he was a little more brazen. Lucy, I need your help one more time. Are you in trouble again? The paramedic grinned. Not again, but still. I guess I'm just unlucky or something. Trouble just keeps coming at me. Before I can even deal with one problem, another one comes knocking at the door. My wife's mother showed up unannounced. The girl shrugged her shoulders in surprise. It seems to me that when relatives come to visit, it's a joyous occasion. But this relative can spoil everything. 
and believe me, there is no joy from her, only trouble. The paramedic thought his joke was a good one and burst into laughter. Lucy did not share his cheerful mood, thinking his colleague's remark inappropriate. She said indifferently, All right, Jacob, I'll let you go. Some time passed, and the paramedic disappeared again without warning. It was the height of the rowing season when suspected poisoning was on the rise among patients who could get to the paramedic station on their own. Lucy took calls on the spot in between waves of patients and also had to cycle to neighboring villages. It was in this real-life situation that an expensive foreign car pulled up to the paramedic station. Ariana, she threw Lucy a condescending glance. So you're the new doctor? Yes, that's me. If you have an appointment, come into the office. The visitor laughed. Well, I'm not really worried about my health. I'm fine because, unlike some people, I don't eat junk food. To speed things up, the doctor asked, Has anyone close to you been sick? The woman raised her perfectly straight eyebrows disapprovingly. Well, how should I put this? I don't even know the right way to say it. My ex-husband ate something and now his stomach hurts. I wanted to call an ambulance, but my neighbor said it was useless. She advised me to come to you. I understand. Just a moment. Wait. I'll pay for the emergency kit. Tell me your address. I'll be there shortly. We are located off Chicago, Building B, Chicago. Lucy froze. But Chicago is not in our neighborhood. Seeing Lucy heading back with the kit, the visitor stirred. The arrogance disappeared from her leathery face, and she even grabbed Lucy's arm. Doctor, dear Lucy, don't leave me in this difficult situation. Understand that someone very close to me is in critical condition right now. The woman looked at her pleadingly and Lucy felt uncomfortable. Okay, I will examine your patient. You said your spouse ate mushrooms. The woman smiled obediently and corrected the doctor. Yes, my ex-husband loves culinary experiments and it's useless to tell him that it's very dangerous. I have a car, I'll take you there and then bring you back. Already sitting behind the wheel, the woman introduced herself as Ariana. But you can call me Ariana. I don't mind. I can't stand conventions at all. Our society has a distorted view of family relationships. I completely reject all conventions. Ariana was an experienced driver. She felt confident even on a bumpy country road. Lucy watched with admiration as she deftly maneuvered around potholes and bumps. But the new acquaintances did not pay attention to such trifles and continued to tell the young doctor about the peculiarities of their family life. My husband and I have been divorced for five years, but we have managed to keep good relations. We have a business together and our friendship has a positive effect on our business. Lucy was about to say something neutral when the woman interrupted her. We're almost there. See that two-story cottage? That's our country house. After the divorce, we didn't divide the property like some people do. We decided it would be much easier to live together. Lucy couldn't resist asking, and how do you manage that if it's no secret? It's very simple. We set up a visiting schedule so we don't overlap on the grounds. Tim, that's my husband's name, comes here on certain days, I stick to my schedule too. And if there are any special situations that arise that go beyond the schedule, that is also easily solved. You just need to inform your companion about force majeure. But Lucy had no personal experience of married life. Her grandparents adhered to completely different principles. Therefore, she could not judge other people's family life. Although Ariana surprised her with her frank story, the girl quickly turned her attention to her professional duties. Entering the spacious lobby on the first floor of the house, she immediately asked, Can you please tell me where I can wash my hands and then escort me to the sick man? The owner of the house, Sophia, escorted the doctor to the bathroom and waited for her to wash her hands before handing her fresh towels. The patient was in a small room on the first floor. Ariana opened the door and announced in a tragic voice, Tim, I brought the doctor, get ready to be examined. In the room, Lucy could barely make out a man lying on a pile of pillows. She asked the landlady to pull the curtains open. Please the curtains, it's so dark and stuffy in here. And she hurriedly complied with the doctor's request. Sunlight flooded the room and the man frowned. I could slap you, Lucy reassured him, but then you die. What are you complaining of? Weakness, severe nausea. I was sick last night too, and my stomach hurts. Walking doesn't hurt much. 
Watching the examination from the sidelines, Haryana decided it was time to speak up. Doctor, without an examination, I can tell you that Tim has food poisoning. Yesterday, they all went to the woods together, picking different mushrooms and then had a picnic in the yard. Suddenly, the man interrupted the woman very abruptly. What kind of nonsense are you talking about? You are misleading the doctor. We were alone under a birch tree, picking hogs, and these are elite mushrooms. He looked hopefully at the doctor, and I ate only a little of the fish soup. My stomach was bothering me before that. I thought maybe I'd lifted something heavy. Lucy asked the patient to lie still. We're going to check your stomach now. She didn't even have time to touch that part of his body before the man cried out in pain. Lucy looked at Arian meaningfully. It appears your patient has acute appendicitis. The woman frowned disapprovingly. Are you sure? The doctor calmly replied. No, but all the symptoms point to it. We'll have to call an ambulance, because in cases like this, delay could cost lives. Arian's former self-confidence returned to her. What are you talking about? You're trying to scare us. You have no experience, so I don't trust you. Why did you call me in then? Lucy grabbed her kit and headed for the exit, holding her right side. Tim jumped up from the bed. In a burst of emotion, he even raised his hand at his ex-wife. What kind of person are you? Do you really want me to die here from appendicitis? Let's call an ambulance. He caught up with Lucy already in the hallway. Doctor girl, don't run away. I can't catch up with you. The girl stopped. Sick. Do you really think it's better not to make unnecessary movements? The man couldn't stand straight, so he'd been over, writhing in pain. You're making me run after you. Please don't leave me alone. Honestly, I'm afraid my ex Lucy won't call an ambulance because of her principles. Tim looked around. I should have arranged it with her beforehand and then called the doctor. Where's your phone? The man holding his side pointed to the coffee table. Here's a reliable satellite device. Lucy had experience with such devices and dialed the emergency number. Soon an ambulance arrived and the doctor had to go with the patient to the district hospital as the owner of the house refused this mission. Ariana felt insulted. I can see that my presence is not necessary. She kissed the man's hand with ostentatious tenderness as a sign of protection. I will not be silent and waved her hand from the porch. Tim is recovering. If I have a moment to spare, I'll be sure to visit you. The man sighed bitterly. Doctor, imagine, I've lived with that snake for over 10 years. Perhaps he expected words of sympathy, but the girl was silent. They didn't say a word to each other until they reached the hospital. From the emergency room, the patient was quickly transferred to the operating room. The doctor on duty praised Lucy. You did well, colleague. You worked quickly and correctly diagnosed the patient. The praise somewhat embarrassed him, and she even tried to justify herself. But it's just appendicitis. Even a second-year student wouldn't misdiagnose it. The doctor on duty shook his head. You are deeply mistaken. Like any other disease, appendicitis likes to disguise itself. So consider yourself lucky today. Consider that luck and accomplishment. The appendix literally burst in the surgeon's hands. Another half hour and we would have had peritonitis. After saying that, Lucy couldn't just go back to Colorado. With the surgeon's permission, she visited the patient. Tim's face was paler than a sheet, but he was smiling. Tell me, what's your name? My visitor? Lucy, I mean Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. He kissed her hand, and that kiss burned with fire until the evening. The next day, the girl remembered the sick man she had saved in his kiss. Even Jacob noticed the girl's strange behavior. Lucy, what's the matter with you? You're glowing. I would have thought you were in love. Lucy caught his co-worker's eye. Jacob, you have a strange idea. Unfortunately, love is not a small thing, but the ultimate reward. Lucy looked at the paramedic in surprise. Those are just pretty words. In real life, it's different. Jacob only smiled, but he kept his opinion. A little time passed, and the girl changed her views on love and life. After being discharged from the hospital, the businessman with a talking surname went into the paramedic station to once again express his gratitude to the young doctor. He did it beautifully and pompously. First, he scattered snow-white roses on the porch. And then right from the porch, he made a fiery speech praising the humble village doctors who selflessly saved the lives of ordinary people. 
the residents of nearby houses gathered to watch this colorful performance. And Tim, surprised by the speed of the grapevine, was impressed. Tim's show was spectacular, and it couldn't have been more different. After all, improvisation was the businessman's favorite skill. During the years of hard life, when there were only piranhas and hyenas around you, the man excelled in this art. However, the modest inhabitants of the small village were content with more modest spectacles, even on television. So they almost clapped their hands with delight, and the elderly matrons even wept secretly. How beautifully he arranged everything, just like in the movies. How lucky our doctor! Delighted sighs came to Lucy, and she even mentally noted that the villagers recognized her as their own. To realize this sense of community was as pleasant for the girl as watching Tim. Lucy had never felt such strong emotions in her life. At those moments, she was insanely happy and thought that such a man could only be a dream. If I were lucky enough to meet such a man, I would love only him for the rest of my life. Perhaps it was at that very moment that her thoughts were poetically transmitted to the fairy she believed in as a child. The sorceress, with the help of her all-powerful wand, instantly turned the girl's life around after an epic performance on the shabby porch of the village dead. Tim decided not to waste any time and immediately proposed to this Lucy. The girl accepted without a second thought. She did not even suspect that the businessman fully coordinated this important step with his first wife. The main feature of their marriage with Tim was his ex, Lucy Ariana. When Lucy saw her rival's name on the guest of honor list at their wedding, it caused her sincere indignation. Tim, I'm sick of this. It's like your ex, Lucy, is everywhere. You can't even hide from her at night. I wouldn't be surprised if one day your Ariana crawls out from under the bed at the most intimate moment. The man listened to Lucy, smiling guiltily, and answered Lucy calmly. You and I are modern people, so it is not appropriate to start our life together with scandals and quarrels. I can tell you one thing. Ariana has done a lot. Basically, she made me a prominent figure in the business world. And although our marital relationship has long since cooled, we tried to maintain business ties and that's worth a lot, the girl Riley remarked. I can't judge, because I have completely different values. At that moment, she was most surprised not by her husband-to-be statement, but by the way Tim uttered this monologue. The man said it all in a calm tone, but made it clear that Lucy's opinion did not matter much to him. The girl decided not to aggravate the situation before the wedding, but after the celebration, such episodes were repeated regularly. Very soon Lucy realized that her opinion and feelings do not need anyone because her husband consults with his first wife on all important issues. Ariana could show up at their new home at any time. Without any shyness, she gave advice to young Lucy of her ex-husband. Acquaintances even admired the nobility of this woman. Ariana is the epitome of decency. Our planet counts on women like her. Where else can you find such an example of self-sacrifice without any selfishness? She helps her ex-husband's young lady-in-waiting. Lucy herself, as well as her elderly relatives, did not share such enthusiasm. The old people were horrified by the news that their granddaughter is marrying a capital city businessman. Anna, in duet with Nancy's grandmother, recited for days on end. Lucy, this is crazy. I don't understand what this man has done for you. We've lived long lives and we know that hasty marriages don't lead to anything good. Baba Nancy nodded vigorously at first, topped with a slay wink, and then decided to put in her weighty word. Yes, girl, she's right. Think to yourself, what's the age difference? After all, your Tim is 17 years older than you. He's like a father to you. At that moment, the women were firmly interrupted by Grandpa Anthony. Nancy, what does age have to do with it? It's normal. It's good to have a husband much older than his wife. This Tim is an established man, and he's not going to bother his parents. Personally, I'm more concerned about something else. Grandma didn't like to be interrupted. She pressed her thin lips together disapprovingly and glared fiercely at her husband. Do you really have to interfere? I know perfectly well what's bothering you. Grandfather realized that the conversation is taking an undesirable turn and peacefully asked the crook to remember the proverb. He who remembers old times, woe to him. You, Anthony, better watch your eyes. We're telling the truth. Actually, this whole thing is very suspicious. I mean this Ariana, sticking her nose in everything. 
Our women told us how she tried to set her own rules in the village, but she was quickly put in her place. I didn't like that either. I can't even imagine a situation like this where the ex-husband and Lucy are so close. They practically live together. I'm trying to understand why Tim would want that. He married a young girl for the second time. Grandma Nancy's eyes bulged with horror. Oh, saints. Maybe they're in cahoots, plotting some kind of scam. Listen to this nonsense. Lucy had no more strength. She laughed merrily. Grandmothers, you'll end up calling the emergency services because of this. Simply because here, far away from civilized life, other customs reign. That's why you find it wild that ex-spouses are on friendly terms. And age has nothing to do with it. Grandpa Anthony is right. A mature man is much more reliable than a green youth. Both grandmothers simultaneously looked at her granddaughter, but said nothing. Only after the wedding with undisguised sadness in her voice said, Lucy, a strong man beside you. That's good. But often such people close themselves off from others. I'm very afraid you'll lose yourself, sitting in your husband's shadow. And I also want to tell you not to let this woman, you know who I'm talking about, commanding you in your own home. The girl knew her grandmother had a keen sense of foresight. She remembered the warning and tried to resist her husband's influence, but it didn't last long. The first line of defense collapsed when Tim demanded that his young wife quit her job a few months after the wedding. Lucy, I need a calm and loving Lucy. With your shifts and late night commutes, that's not gonna happen. That's why I insist you quit your job. Lucy tried to object. Tim, I can't live without a job. I spent years studying to become a doctor. My parents also devoted themselves to this noble profession. The businessman wrinkled his nose in disgust. Lucy, this is getting unbearable. You're always talking in Soviet-era slogans. Your old folks really pumped you up. But times have changed now. You are my Lucy, and I am able to provide for you and our future children. The day after this conversation, Ariana showed up unannounced. From the expression on her face, Lucy realized that she had something to say to her. And that hunch was confirmed as they drank tea together. First, Lucy Tim informed her knowledgeably. I didn't want to tell you, Lucy, but our marriage to Tim broke up for many reasons. But chief among them was my reluctance to quit my job. At the time, I was just starting to get my career off the ground. I had a good position and a high salary. Plus, I had a son. You probably didn't know that Tim, as they say, took me in with child. Lucy looked at her interlocutor in surprise. No, I didn't know. I thought Robert was Tim's son. He even has a middle name. Ariana waved her hand carelessly. I insisted that my husband adopt the boy. Robert's father was not of good character, and he wasn't interested in his son from the start. Tim did his best to make sure the boy didn't lack parental love, and I'm very grateful to him for that. Then why did you get divorced if everything was fine? Ariana looked at Lucy strangely. You seem to be an educated girl, don't you understand? Tim really wanted to have a child of his own. Over the years, that desire became an obsession, and I got in the way of those plans. How? Very simply, I couldn't have any more babies, or rather, at first I didn't want to, because my career was more important to me. And then I was sure that one child was enough for complete family happiness. But one day my career collapsed. On top of this unpleasantness, I found out that previous miscarriages had made me infertile. Listening to the confessions of my husband's ex-wife, Jane, was not very pleasant and she tried to avoid the subject, but apparently she decided to make light of the situation. When Jane and I met, he was like a helpless chick, and I was already a hawk. I had connections and money, and I willingly invested it in my husband, hoping to get something in return in time. That admission shocked the young woman. So Tim owes you everything. And that doesn't bother you at all? Not at all. Some people sell their souls to achieve their goals. Others work until the grave. It's up to each man to choose what's best for him. Lucy thought that this woman with her cynical attitude to life is terrible. In the evening, when her tired husband came home, she said, Tim, if it's necessary for our family happiness, I'll quit my job at the clinic. Especially since soon there will be an addition to our family. Just please don't say anything and leave. Her husband pulled her into his arms and spun her around in a dance. When the initial emotions had subsided a bit, Tim asked, So why did you suddenly change your attitude towards your uncle? Lucy replied, 
Not all at once. It didn't happen all of a sudden. I didn't like that woman from the beginning. There is something mysterious and even sinister about her. I think you're exaggerating, though there's some truth in your observations. I myself have long been weighed down by this union, but unfortunately, I can't do anything about it because you are a creation of your ex-wife. I am right. The man sighed heavily. Part of it was. The entire business, all the finances and real estate are registered in Arian's name. If I end our relationship, I'll be left with nothing. But then Ariana has a lot to lose. Something like that. In short, she has all the paperwork, or rather her lawyer, who basically controls everything. Can't anything be changed? Not at the moment. Oh yes, very clever and perceptive. She's thought of everything, and to make sure nothing happens that she can't control. She's got me under her control too, Tim. So I too, have been controlled by your ex-wife against my will. Admit it, she encouraged you to marry me. The man looked away and coughed. It was a sign of confusion, but Lucy decided to press him. Tim, don't be sarcastic. I repeat the question. I too, am under Arian's control. Tim sighed helplessly. I'm sorry, but it just happened. I didn't want to upset you, but before we got married, Ariana made me sign a document in which I turned over full control of the company to her. Just in case something happened, I hope you understand. Oh my God, but it's like involuntary servitude. Tim, let's go somewhere far away. You're smart and resourceful, and you can make your own life. I can and I will when the time comes. Lucy realized that there was a hidden meaning in her husband's words, that he had some plan, but she did not want to pester him with questions because she was tired of the intrigues in which she had to plunge after the wedding. Days and months flew by. Twins Billy and Steve were born on time and healthy. The happy father sat for hours under the maternity ward windows and acted like a little boy. Ariana didn't show up until the day the babies were discharged. The appearance of this woman spoiled the mood of Anthony's grandparents, who, despite his age and ailments, was eager to go to the capital. The old man regretfully noticed the appearance of this witch. It was a pity he had forgotten to put garlic in his pockets. Oh yes, I heard the old man's remark, but only whispered back with slumbering ignorance. I don't know what to talk about with such people. You cursed Root. What a lady we have here. You should mind your own business and stay out of other people's families. Why are you picking on the guy? As if he's your property. Serfdom was abolished a century and a half ago under the Tsar. Lucy later found out about the dispute. If she hadn't intervened, there would have been a fight outside the maternity ward. Her grandmother tried to calm the outraged intruder. She said as gently as she could, Ariana, why did you come? Why are you disturbing people? Let your ex-husband live in peace. It's time to realize and accept that he is not your property. He is a free man and she threw the bouquet of roses into the snow and muttered something unintelligible. I walked to the parking lot. I guess she expected Tim to run after her, but he didn't even move. Grandpa Anthony looked sadly at his son-in-law. Be strong, my boy. Women like your Ariana do not forgive offenses. Don't you want to move to another town for a while? And don't leave an address. The couple decided to follow the old man's advice and soon settled in the apartment. Of course, this move was incomplete because Tim could not leave his business. He regularly traveled to the capital and often stayed there for several days. This arrangement suited Lucy, but when her grandmother died, the young woman realized that she could no longer stay in the apartment where everything reminded her of her loved one. She decided to sell the apartment as she was constantly busy with her children. She entrusted her husband with the task. They quickly found a new, more spacious apartment Lucy again entrusted the transaction to her husband. The woman did not pay much attention to the fact that her husband registered the new apartment in his name. Only after almost 10 years, she bitterly regretted her frivolous attitude to such important issues. Almost 12 years of married life flew by like a blink of an eye. During these years, the family has experienced both joys and sorrows. Lucy more than once thought of divorce, but now, after the tragedy, all the disagreements and disputes she considered unimportant trifles. The woman again felt the unfriendly gaze and looked toward Arian and Robert. Her stepson was literally drilling her with his gaze, and his mother was smiling hypocritically. The widow sensed something in those hostile glances that made her wary. 
for she had studied the character of her predecessor well enough. Ariana was clever and resourceful. She did nothing without reason. She was also a mysterious woman and loved ambiguity. Lucy remembered how in yesterday's phone conversation, she had specifically hinted at some circumstances that would change everything after the funeral. It made the girl tense up. All the rest of the day, she thought about her fate and the rival's shenanigans, and these thoughts did not give her peace even after the funeral service. Emotions overwhelmed her, and she herself did not notice how she said aloud, that old witch, she's definitely up to some mischief. She smells like a skunk. As these unpleasant epithets were uttered rather loudly, Billy, the elder of the twins, became an unwilling witness to this passionate speech. Mom, it's not nice to express yourself like that. And eavesdropping is a bad habit, too. You were yelling so loud it was impossible not to hear. I suppose Aunt Ariana finally got to you. Billy, what kind of slang is that? I'm taking after you. Now all we have besides you is ourselves. Ariana doesn't count because she's not family. Yeah, well, to be honest, my brother and I can't stand her. Lucy paused for a second and sighed. I don't like her either. Lucy sank back into her thoughts while her son watched her absent-mindedly chopping cabbage. The woman thought sadly that her husband's death didn't seem to have affected the boys much. They took the sad news surprisingly calmly, and at the funeral, they didn't even shed a single tear. Of course, such indifference caused her mother surprise and fear. Lucy thought it was the perfect moment to point this fact out to her 10-year-old son. Billy, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think your father's death made any impression on you or your brother. The boy looked into his mother's eyes and philosophically remarked, Man is mortal, and we all find ourselves on the other side of reality sooner or later. Daddy didn't die, he just passed into another world. The woman hugged her child. You've been reading a lot of nonsense and fantasizing. It's easy to talk about parallel worlds when you're not burdened with responsibilities. The son interrupted impatiently. Do you think things will be different for us now? Of course, it's going to be very difficult without Daddy. In the kitchen, behind Steve's back. Quiet. You guys were yelling so loud I heard everything. The boy walked around the table and approached his mother. On the other side. Mom, you don't even have to worry about the hardship. After all, Billy and I are here and can protect you. Daddy taught us that men are supposed to protect the weak and women. And Billy and I are real men. You are my protectors. The young mother's concern touched their hearts and tears ran down Lucy's cheeks as she hugged the boys. I hope we won't be lost with you. It's too bad our grandparents aren't alive. We have no one. I can't even imagine what we will live on. Steve consoled his mother. Now, legally, all the business and property will pass to us. We are the heirs. The boy wanted to add something else, but suddenly blurted out, Billy, Steve, you're so naive. You forgot about Arian's aunt who ran away from Arian. Steve continued to chuckle, so no one would know about her. She got tangled up in her kimono. The boys exchanged glances and burst into laughter. Their mother had to scold them. Children, I think you picked the wrong time to joke around. Have you forgotten that your father is dead? Billy looked at her ingratiatingly. We can't cry all the time. The funeral's over. And we all have a life to live. Believe me. Dad would have told you the same thing. Remember, he didn't like sour faces. Lucy smiled. Yes, your father was a man of good cheer. The pleasant memories came flooding back into the woman's mind, and at that moment the phone rang. The twins exchanged glances, and Steve rushed to the door with an exclamation. Surely that bloody aunt must have come to see us. Lucy hurried after her son into the hallway, where Ariana was already standing with a disgruntled look. Lucy, you need to get down to the business of raising your sons. I'm sure Tim would not approve of this behavior. The guest grabbed Steve's arm and looked at him disapprovingly. Can you talk about adults like that? Who taught you bad language, boy? The boy jerked his hand away. And who taught you to grab other people's children? You have a son of your own? Then grab him. Lucy felt uncomfortable, though she was not pleased with the guest's appearance. Children, go to your room. We need to talk to Aunt Ariana. The twins wandered off and headed for the children's room. Ariana followed them with a scratchy look. The tomboys are like a cartoon, two peas in a pod. How will they live without their father now? It's okay. 
We'll get through this temporary hardship. Come into the kitchen. I am cooking and busy. The guest followed the hostess. For some time, both women were silent, but this pause resembled a preparation for a major battle. The young widow sensed that an unpleasant conversation awaited her. Ariana, you didn't come all this way just to talk about tea, did you? The guest giggled nervously. Well, I'm so cold I could use a cup of tea, if it's not too much trouble for you. Lucy endured her rival's piercing stare. What difficulty could there be with a pot of tea? I'm sure you didn't come here for a tea ceremony. You guessed correctly. In fact, I had hoped we would discuss things together the morning after the funeral. But you left so quickly, though a widow should stay until the end. I'm sorry, but I can't stand mourning and all these rituals since I was a child. The children were tired too and asked to go home. You could have warned me of your departure. Again, I'm sorry. Ariana waved her hand, warding off pesky insects. Okay, let's not dwell on such trivialities. Lucy, you can probably see why I made such a long journey, as you yourself just noticed, not for sport. Lucy turned off the gas and poured tea for her guests. Of course I understand. Just let's get straight to the point without further ado. Ariana took a small sip and closed her eyes. What a rich flavor, a real tea. By the way, not everyone can afford such a luxury. Even among my acquaintances, there are people who save on tea and drink all sorts of crap from low-quality raw materials. Lucy still didn't understand what the guests were getting at. My grandmother taught me to appreciate good tea. She herself was a fan of this noble beverage, devotion to tradition. That's commendable, but times change, and one must sometimes adjust one's habits to fit them. This uncertainty began to irritate the young widow, and she asked irritably, Ariana, you traveled almost 200 kilometers just to talk about tea. The guest grumbled unhappily. My God, why are you getting so worked up? You always take everything so seriously. Can't we just talk peacefully about the future? Speak up, I'm listening to you carefully. I see, you're not in the mood for a peaceful conversation. Good, then I'll have to give you the facts. Ariana opened her briefcase and pulled out a stack of papers. She threw the papers on the desk with irritation. Lucy was surprised and asked, Why the gestures? The woman remarked wryly. But didn't you ask me to speak without unnecessary verbal nonsense? These are the documents confirming that your late husband left you with nothing, or rather nothing. The plate slipped out of the young woman's hands and fell to the floor, breaking into small shards. The guest remarked indignantly, Why are you so careless? As if we don't have enough problems in our house. By the way, are you aware that this apartment is also not yours? Most likely, you know absolutely nothing about your husband. What should I know? And who can evict me from a place I bought with my money? Evict you, the bailiffs, unless you leave the property voluntarily. I can tell you one thing about Tim. He was a man with a hidden agenda. During our happy marriage, I noticed my husband taking money without asking. We had a joint account at the time. I didn't like it, so I decided to keep an eye on him. I thought he was flirting with other women, but it turned out to be much worse. He was gambling. Lucy felt her breathing become labored. She too had had similar suspicions but her husband had laughed at her fears. With a sigh, she asked. Did he play computer games? Her rival laughed in her face. Lucy, well, what is that to boys? And Tim was a real man. So he played big, that is, in the stock market. He always dreamed of getting rich in one fell swoop and took risks without looking back. Many times I tried to cool him down and he would calm down for a while. But then it started all over again. Lucy didn't want to believe what she was hearing. It couldn't be true. Tim couldn't have done this to us. You don't believe it? Look at these documents. They're promissory notes. Tim owes a lot of people. And I'm the one who's gonna have to clean up this mess. Ariana pulled one document out of a pile of papers. And here's the mortgage. Enjoy your apartment. Her heart first jumped to her throat, then dropped. Lucy desperately grabbed the back of the chair, but it couldn't be. I can't go outside in the middle of winter with two kids. Ariana was triumphant. She had managed to humiliate this peasant girl who thought she was important. For a few seconds, she enjoyed her young rival's confusion, but she wanted to humiliate her even more. And in the same submissive tone, she suggested, Lucy, don't be so despondent. Together, we can find a way out of this impasse. 
Lucy raised her eyes full of despair. But is there a way out? I don't just mean a way out of the impasse, but a solution. The guest jumped up from her chair and hugged like a mother. There is, I can offer you and the children a place to stay in our country house. You remember Chicago. You must remember that marvelous place. It was in Chicago that you performed a professional feat when you saved Tim from certain death. I still marvel at your selfless act. I could not have done that. Lucy was tired of listening to her guest's enthusiastic speech, and she interrupted her abruptly. Yes, I remember that village, but there is no school or hospital there, so it's not a suitable option for us. Ariana looked at her in surprise and narrowed her snake-like eyes. Why? What's wrong with that? You'll have to look for a job, and there aren't any in the village. Lucy replied, Ariana, I will not be your maid. You have such a great plan to make me your slave. It won't work. You can drown in your own anger, but it won't work. You have chosen the wrong man. The guest jumped up as if she'd been stung. We'll see about that. You'll be baiting bread at my feet. Do you think you can go back to your profession? You won't. I'll make conditions so bad you won't be able to find work, not even as a cleaner or laundress. Already at the door, Ariana shouted, I'll give you a week to pack and I don't want you breathing in this apartment. The door slammed and the guest disappeared. The only reminder of her rival's visit was the sickeningly sweet scent of her perfume. Lucy sat down on a chair and burst into tears. The twins crept into the kitchen and began to comfort their mother. Mommy, don't cry please. We will help you and everything will be all right. We will do well in school. The boy's support calmed the woman down a bit. She smiled through her tears. With such helpers, I won't be lost, and we have a place to get through the hard times, don't we? Billy's eyes lit up. You want me to tell you a fortune? We'll be staying at Grandma Nancy and Grandpa Anthony's house. That's right. That's great. I like the village, and the guys there are nice. It's probably even better in the winter than in the summer. Although the woman wasn't sure of that statement, she didn't want to disappoint her son. All right, guys, let's hope for the best, and to make sure we don't waste any time, Let's start packing. Take only the essentials with you. Steve was disappointed with that stipulation. So I can bring a construction kit? Does that mean toys aren't on the list of essentials? The boy sighed sadly. Can I bring books? Only the essentials. Steve muttered something to himself, but he didn't dare argue with his mother. They had two days to pack. Lucy wanted very much to spite her rival. After thinking about it, she decided to organize an urgent sale of furniture dishes and household appliances. Some of the things were bought by neighbors and part of it she gave to a large family from a neighboring house, taking into account the proceeds. The widow was very pleased. For a few months we will lead a carefree existence, and then we'll see. She tried not to think about the future because the unknown frightened her. They spent the last night in an empty apartment. They had to sleep on the floor, but the boys, tired with excitement, paid no attention to the inconvenience. As soon as their heads touched the pillows, they fell asleep. And the widow. She enjoyed imagining Ariana boiling with indignation when she saw the completely empty apartment. The next morning, Lucy couldn't resist calling Ariana. We have vacated the apartment. You can use it. I hope we don't owe you anything else. Radish shouted into the receiver. Wait, don't hang up. I wanted to do something nice. Lucy disconnected the phone, then pulled out and snapped this SIM card. I don't believe you. And I know for a fact that dangerous acquaintances should be cut off without hesitation. Of all the valuable possessions she could freely dispose of, there was the budget sit-in given to her by her elders for her 30th birthday. Of them she remembered with warmth and gratitude. Thank you, my dear ones. Your gift is simply invaluable in this situation. It's a wonder Ariana hadn't gotten her hands on that car sooner. On her last night in the apartment where the happiest years had flown by, she thought of Tim. She was hurt that the husband she loved had allowed a complete stranger to run their family's life. The woman whispered all the way, Where are you? Where are you? What have you done? There was a moment when the image of her late husband appeared before her eyes. This vision did not frighten the widow, but on the contrary, pleased her. Tim looked guilty and smiled as if he wanted to say something in his own defense. Lucy in her childhood and youth, she read a lot and was always amazed at how different authors described the moment of the hero's return to this homeland. There was no way she expected to feel excitement on the way to Colorado. 
The closer she got to her destination, the more anxious she became. It was a very strange feeling, for she had not been born in this place, not in a village among the forests, but in a city. Billy noticed his mother's anxiety. Mom, well, why are you so nervous? Calm down, or we'll have an accident like this. Steve patted his brother on the head. Shame on you. Remember what Grandma Nancy said? You can't say anything like that on the road. Mama's worried enough as it is, and you're just putting your own words in. But Billy could no longer be calmed. He decided to remind his older brother and warn him of the consequences of disobedience. Remember how Grandma said you had a nail sticking out in one place? That's why you need to be watched. If you start being naughty, Mom and I will take you to the woods and leave you there. Steve only laughed and wasn't scared. I feel at home in the woods. When we went camping as a class, Barbara told us how to behave in extreme situations to survive. Billy learned his lesson quickly. The travelers showed up when the whole class could be heroes. I want to see you whimper with fear when you're alone. The brothers' faces burned with anger. They were ready to lash out at each other, but Mom, who was watching their argument in the mirror, warned them. If you don't calm down now, I'll throw you both out of here, and then you'll have to walk to the village. The prospect of walking to the village, with man-high snowdrifts on both sides, dampened the quarrelsome fervor. The brothers made disgruntled faces and fell silent. The last time Lucy had been in the village was more than two years ago. She had come to visit the graves of her elders, to check on the condition of the house she had inherited, and to prevent her property from being taken over by fellow villagers and outsiders who were after other people's property. She asked Julian, the paramedic's wife, to keep an eye on the house. The last time she knocked on the door of her acquaintance's house, Jacob himself came out to her. Lucy, I'm glad to see you. You've come at just the right time. Are you interested in your house? Tim, did you find that strange? Who was interested? A very respectable man. He wants to have a summer house in an environmentally friendly place. So he liked Anthony's cabin and asked him to call if you were planning to sell the house. Jacob handed her a slip of an old receipt with a cell phone number scribbled on it. Lucy didn't even look at the note. I don't even have thoughts like that. I'm asking you. If anyone asks you about this again, tell them the house isn't for sale. Jacob scratched his head and hid the note. As you can imagine, I'd think about it if I were you. After all, the house needs care for the winter. The wood freezes, and then there's dampness and mold. It'll rot without proper care for your inheritance. And if you sold it, at least you'd make some money, right? Lucy thanked the paramedic for the warning and asked him to take care of the property. Of course, she promised to pay him extra for this favor. The man happily agreed and asked for an upfront payment. Remembering the paramedic, the woman smiled. She regretted that she hadn't warned him of her arrival, but she was sure that everything was fine in the house. But when the car pulled up to Lucy's house, she was amazed Lucy. A path led from the gate to the porch, and a plump suitcase stood right at the doorstep. The woman jumped out of the car and ran toward the house. What kind of trickery is this? Who is trying to move into someone else's house? No one answered that question. The children also came to the scene, and Steve immediately grabbed the suitcase. Lucy yelled at her son not to touch it. There was no telling what was inside, and it was not customary to touch strange objects. Billy burst into laughter. You're scaring yourself with an ordinary suitcase. Maybe someone forgot it or accidentally left it behind. The boy didn't have time to fully develop his theory, because a strange man wearing a hat with ears down was hurrying down the path toward the house. This is my suitcase, children. Don't you dare touch anyone else's stuff. The twins were confused and Lucy walked toward the stranger. And who are you to make decisions on someone else's territory? The man froze in place. I live here, or rather, I will live here. Lucy became aggressive. So you've decided you're going to live here. Did you decide that on your own? Well, I could easily report you to the authorities. The stranger started backing away. Woman, wait, don't yell. I don't understand why you're so upset. The landlord gave me the keys and I paid six months in advance. What landlord? This is my house. You see, good citizen, this is my house. And this whole area is legally mine too. Lucy made an expressive gesture with her hands and looked at the imposter. He realized that he was in an unpleasant situation and stumbled at half a word. 
You see, I had an extraordinary situation in life. I urgently needed a place to live outside the city. The woman smirked, but more calmly asked. And why? Away from the city, there are probably problems with the law. The man stared at her. Do you think I'm a criminal? You said yourself that you had to go into hiding. I said nothing of the sort. You, madam, are the one making up stories as you go along. I am not your madam. Not only did you trespass, but you insulted me. I didn't say anything insulting to you. As usual, Billy spoke up at the most crucial moment. Uncle, don't yell at my mom. Steve joined his brother too and manfully squared his shoulders. Do you think that if we don't have a father anymore, you can mistreat our mom? The man glared at them and took two steps back, but stumbled. The stranger was tumbling around in the snow trying to get out of the trap, and the brothers laughed at his helplessness. The boys expected approval from their mother, but she looked at them sternly. What do you want? Help the man get out instead. The stranger spoke up. Thank you. I can handle the threats myself. The man stood on a narrow path covered with snow. I was just heading that way. You could have at least said thank you. Lucy muttered. I don't see the need for that. Take your suitcase and leave. I've got nowhere to go, and there's no money for a place to stay. I paid off my landlord yesterday, and today I brought my things here to pay him back. And then you came and attacked me. Lucy stepped back and burst into tears. The stranger approached her with a guilty look and patted her on the shoulder. Don't cry, Lucy. I'll fix it. The woman through her tears said, Dan Ryder, I knew it wouldn't end well. So you spent someone else's money. Calm down. I didn't drink it. I bought useful equipment for my motorcycle, Jacob announced. But the news had the opposite effect on his weeping wife. Steve, where's your equipment? There's something in our yard. I didn't realize it was there. I hid it in the shed for now. Julian went pale. You found someone you can trust and you're pushing him for a bottle. Oh, dear people, what's going to happen now? The hostess clutched her head and began to cry again. Jacob decided it was time to show his manhood. He shouted at his wife. You will be all right, too. Since you know everything, the tractor is coming. He looked pleadingly at Tim, and I think we'll solve the tenant issue, too. Lucy, in memory of our friendship, let this man stay. You have a spacious house. He will not disturb you. The young widow didn't like that suggestion. Jacob, I can't. I have a family of my own. Lucy, I'm begging you. I won't be in your debt. Besides, you're unemployed now. The woman nodded in agreement, and the paramedic was pleased. But it'll work out here. They're already planning to write me off. I mean, they want to put me on a well-deserved retirement and the position will be vacated, so I can put in a good word for you. Lucy pondered. Jacob rubbed his hands together happily. Well, I think we've come to an agreement. It would be good for Lucy to celebrate the deal. Julian had fully recovered from the shock. She's decided to take her husband for a spin. I'll take care of the bill. Go to the neighbor's house and make sure the machinery is in the yard in five minutes. The guests had no choice but to leave on their own. The boys were silent the whole time while they were inside the house. But as soon as they went outside, they started discussing the exciting incident that guy is so funny. Yeah, he's great. His aunt used to hit him. Mom, have you known them long? Lucy smiled. Yes, I interned here. Jacob taught me. Steve asked. Mom, are you going to be a doctor again? I don't know yet. It depends on how things go. Stranger always went alone. But when he heard the landlady talking to the children, he asked. Maybe it won't work. As far as I know, there's an acute shortage of personnel in our medicine. Yes, there is a problem, but the thing is, I've hardly ever worked in my field. I have a little over a year of experience, so now I can only count on a vacancy as a nurse, and even then in the best case. What does it take to get reinstated? Courses and recertification. It's a lot of work. I didn't even realize medicine would be so strict. It's true. You know, our dean at the university said that medicine should be as disciplined as the military. And your dean is right. I'm sorry, Lucy, but don't you think it's strange that we had a fight and a reconciliation and we haven't been introduced? Victor. The twins watched with interest as the stranger shook their mother's hand. Steve nudged his brother. Look, let's slow down a little. Billy pulled over. Steve, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Whispered the boy as they walked. Well, I think it's all right, man. 
I didn't like him at first, though. Neither did I, but look at him now. The plump suitcase still stood proudly on the porch. The boys were happy. Yay. Nobody took it. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. Lucy looked sternly at her sons, and Victor pretended not to hear the street slang. It was very cold in the house, and he asked cheerfully, Guys, why don't we light the stove? Billy immediately exclaimed, Yes, because it's such a clown in here. Steve, embarrassed, said, But we don't know how to light the stove. We always used to come here in the summer when it was warm. Grandma Nancy sometimes stoked the stove. She used to make us tea and pancakes. Remembering great-grandma's treats, Steve rolled his eyes and stuck out his tongue. He did it so expressively that Victor burst into laughter. It's okay. Guys, I'll teach you how to light the stove. My grandfather taught me that craft. Billy liked the relaxed conversation, and he became bolder. Uncle Victor, do you know how to make fishing rods? I sure do. I'll tell you a secret. I came here to raise fish. There are many small lakes and rivers in this area. If you organize the business correctly, the costs will quickly pay it off, and it will be good for the reservoirs. Lucy couldn't help but admire the trio sitting by the stove. From the outside, one could think that the father was teaching his sons a simple craft. A thought flashed through the woman's mind. Tim never talked to the children, so plain and simple, he was always in a hurry to get somewhere. The next day, the friendship between the twins and the tenant began to take new forms. The boys found old skis in the attic and Victor patiently taught them how to handle this equipment. In the evening, problems with the wiring were discovered and the tenant quickly solved this issue for the boys. The guys watched him closely and followed his every word. Lucy watched this idyllic scene and felt almost happy. Winter passed imperceptibly, replaced by spring, and then came the long-awaited summer. Life in the house of the young widow fell into its usual course. Lucy spent the whole day at the medical center. Her candidacy was gladly approved by the regional health department, and her little practical experience did not prevent it. Victor also cozily settled down on his side of the house. He diligently and without reminders fulfilled his male duties, and the twins followed him like puppies. In winter, the tenant brought a car from the city and sadly remarked, too bad you don't have a garage, Lucy seconded him. I too am concerned about this circumstance. My car is very sensitive to change, and the weather has been unstable lately. Therefore, the children often have to walk to school, which is more than two kilometers one way. Lucy, why didn't you tell me about this problem before? I can easily take the kids to school and check your car if you trust me. She looked into his eyes but saw nothing but a genuine desire to help. Thank you. You'll be doing me a huge favor. The brothers were overjoyed, but when they found out they'd be driving around in a fancy car. Steve Victor choked up with excitement. Billy, imagine how surprised everyone's gonna be. This isn't your mom's ear that sneezes every hundred yards. Although it was unpleasant to hear such comments about her car, Lucy kept silent. She didn't want to admit to herself that Victor had quietly but firmly entered their lives. They lived together peacefully enough under the same roof. And the woman did not want to think that one day he would leave their home. Most likely, the apartment also thought about parting. One day at dinner, he said sadly, You know, Lucy, my life has changed a lot these past few months. I lost my family a few years ago. Lucy and her daughter decided to take a ride to the zoo and got into an accident. Lucy died on the spot, and the doctors tried to save her daughter, but they couldn't. It was the first time a man had ever spoken so openly to her, and Lucy was taken aback. I didn't know anything about your personal tragedy. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you for your kind words. I know you've been bereaved recently too. The boys told me. Yes, my husband was killed in a stupid accident. It's a shame when a man wasn't even sick. He was always very active, but he slipped, fell, and that was it. Misfortune always comes unexpectedly. I thought I wouldn't survive, but my friends and work helped me. In my free time, I develop programs and travel. I like fishing. There is a lake nearby. I want to rent it for about three years. Fish farming is a very profitable business. I didn't know you could rent a lake. I'd always thought rivers and lakes were public places. They used to be. But today you can take temporary possession of such a natural object. By the way, it is very useful for ecology. 
because the lessee is obliged to keep order and follow a whole list of rules. If you are interested, I can organize a tour for you. The adults thought that the children were engrossed in their work, but after learning about the exciting trip, the brothers shouted in one voice, Uncle Victor, we really want to see your lake. Take us with you. Lucy felt embarrassed by her son's behavior and tried to calm them down. Boys, you can't be so pushy. The man hasn't finished talking and you're already pouncing on him. Victor was apparently pleased with the boy's interest. He winked at them enigmatically. Are you ready? But let's agree that you won't be naughty and won't touch anything. The twins solemnly promised to obey their guide. But as it turned out, trusting their promises was an unforgivable mistake. When they came to a lake hidden deep in the forest, Victor said, Wait here for a while, I'll lock the car, and then we'll all go to the lake together. But Steve was bursting with impatience. He broke free and jumped onto the steep, treacherous shore. The boy forgot caution and slipped down. Lucy shouted to Steve, My God, he can't swim. Billy rushed to save his brother. I can swim. They taught us in gym class. Victor was already quickly undressing and putting on his shoes. He looked at Billy sternly. And you just stand there like we don't need you to save us. It all happened in a matter of seconds, but it seemed like an eternity to Lucy. She had a bad feeling. She was afraid to move, and she was scared to look toward the lake. Until Billy screamed. Mommy, calm down. Steve's alive. Uncle Victor saved him. A minute later, Victor came to shore. He was carrying Steve in his arms. The boy was conscious, but frightened, either because he'd almost died or because he was about to meet his mother. Lucy took a few steps toward them and couldn't move. She slowly sank to the ground and began to cry. Billy stood nearby, confused. Mommy rarely cried. It was like this. I never hide from them at all. Victor set Steve down beside him and sat down on the ground himself. He didn't know what to do now, so he decided to just wait. Any tears had to end at some point. Steve put his hand on his mother's arm. Mom, please don't, don't, don't scold me. Just don't cry. Half an hour later, when everyone had rested and calmed down a bit, they headed towards the house. Victor said, That's all right. I'll tell you about my plans at dinner. The evening went wonderfully. Lucy cooked the meat. She hadn't cooked anything festive for a long time. Victor brought a bottle of expensive wine, put it on the table and said, let's celebrate today's event. After all, Steve now has two birthdays. And then he began to tell about his plans. The boys listened with their mouths open. Only Billy asked one day, how do you know all this about fish, about what they like and don't like? Victor smiled. You see, Billy, before you start any business, you have to learn everything about it. Otherwise, it's no good. No. Of course, you can figure it out as you go along, but then you're not immune to mistakes. This can slow down development and eventually ruin the project. Here is a person was looking for a suitable example and suddenly lifted a finger. For example, a person wants to learn how to ride a bicycle, sits down and falls. And another person first asks someone who has been riding for a long time how to keep his balance, how to properly press the pedals, how to brake. And only then does he get on the bike, and, oh miracle, he starts riding. Steve suddenly laughed. Billy blushed. Lucy tried to hide a smile. Victor didn't know that Billy had been trying unsuccessfully for a week to learn to ride the old bicycle he found in the barn. Victor looked at the boys in surprise, then smiled and asked, did I really hit the mark when Steve was explaining? The man said, smiling. I'll try to teach you tomorrow. There's nothing difficult about it. Billy snorted skeptically. Of course it's nothing hard. Well, you see, but you'll have to be fully rested for that. So finish your dinner and set it up. There was no need to persuade the boys. By the evening in the village, they were so tired they were ready to fall asleep at the table. Plus the shock of the day. Victor, I won't ask if you need help. Victor helped clear the table. She felt strangely calm, peaceful, as if this was how it should be. Exactly like this. Lucy shook her head, pushing the strange thought away. Then she looked at Victor. Maybe grandma's specialty tea. Victor immediately nodded at the tea. That would be just wonderful. And let's enjoy this wonderful evening outdoors. They sat down on the bench that Grandpa had made and drank tea in silence. Lucy realized that Victor wanted to say something, 
but she didn't understand what, but this unfinished thought frightened her for some reason. Lucy. Yes, she turned to him quickly. Victor was silent for a few minutes, picking up the words. I should probably go. I've taken shameless advantage of your hospitality, even though you don't have to tolerate my presence. After all, this is all from Jacob's motorcycle blog. By the way, if he wasn't in trouble, how was his moto? The blog does exist. Lucy smiled first. You know it does, yes. I met his wife recently and she's very happy. She says Billy spends so much time on new technology that he even forgets to drink. Victor laughed. Well, I guess we should forgive him then. Lucy suddenly became serious. You know, Victor, I've been waiting for this conversation. I don't know why, but I was sure it would happen. You're an honest man, but I have to thank you for living with us. First of all, you do all the men's work around the house. Honestly, I don't know how we'd manage without your help. Secondly, the boys catch every word you say, and I know you're not going to teach them anything bad. Third, we feel very safe with you around. So what should we do? Lucy shrugged her shoulders. We have enough space. Why look for something else? You can continue to live with us, unless you have other plans, of course. Victor looked at Lucy carefully, as if expecting her to say something else, but Lucy looked at her feet. Okay, Lucy, thank you, I'll think about it. The next day, Lucy sat in her medical office. Summer is a hot time in the village, and there were far fewer patients. Either everyone had forgotten about their ailments, or they just didn't have the time. In any case, only two or three people had come to see her in the last few days. She perked up when she heard someone enter. You're settling in quite nicely, I see. Lucy looked in surprise at Robert, Arian's son. What are you doing here? Robert sat down on a chair next to the table. What's wrong with you? Could it be that I'm sick and you greet me so unfriendly? Lucy suddenly realized that she felt no emotion, no hatred, no fear, no feeling of a beaten dog that she felt in the presence of Arianne herself or in the presence of her son, she smiled. People like you don't get sick. Robert looked at her in amazement. Wow, have you changed? What can I do for you? Robert looked at Lucy thoughtfully. It looked like it wasn't going to be as easy as his mother had promised. The thing is, some circumstances have come to light. Arian's ex-husband and his adoptive father were not what they all thought they were. At first, there were no questions at all. Everything went to the mother as it should. Then it suddenly became clear that it wasn't that simple. Part of the business, which was registered to Tim, the apartment, which was also registered to him, were written down on the children, and he was doing it secretly from Arianne, although she was sure that she knew everything Tim was doing. Since it was done by a completely different notary, they didn't know about it right away, though Arianne had a hunch. Tim was paying too much attention to this Lucy, even though he had originally married her only so that she would bear him a child, and he realized that the less intimacy between them, the safer, the easier it was for her to control Tim. It was precisely because the woman had some suspicions that she didn't want to let Lucy out of her sight. One thing she wasn't wrong about, Lucy didn't fight for anything, though she could have. After all, they had the money to buy an apartment, they had children together. Now that new circumstances had come to light, something had to be done immediately, because Robert was living in the apartment, so Ariana sent her son. You have to get her to sign the papers. Mom, but I don't know, scare her. Think of something. I can't do everything forever. No one can disobey her. Not even Robert. But to be honest, he was expecting a slightly different encounter. Anyway, he and his mother thought there wouldn't be a problem. Yes, he was in the neighborhood and he'll probably stop by. I came to rest at the cottage. Lucy stood up. If I'm not mistaken, I can't leave you. Robert was tired too. He walked over to Lucy and looked mockingly into her eyes. And Lucy suddenly realized that she was really scared. He had shown up here for a reason. Robert reached for her chin and Lucy flinched. He tried to catch her, but she grabbed the chair in her hand. Go away. Robert walked away satisfied. After all, she's afraid of him. And that's a good thing. In the evening, Victor does something with the boys in the yard. Lucy having finished her chores, also went out and sat on a bench. And so she froze, staring at one point. She did not see that Victor was looking at her intently. When the boys went to bed, he came into the kitchen. 
Lucy, what's wrong? She shuddered, then sat down at the table and began to tell him. Victor listened attentively to the unhappy woman's confession. Sometimes he nodded his head and did not understand how she tolerated it all. Why do you think he came? Lucy shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. I can't even guess. Victor thought for a moment. From his experience, he realized that not much time had passed since her husband's death, so this visit could not be just a courtesy visit. Most likely some new circumstances had come to light. He was planning to go to Tanum in a couple of days to finalize the deed to the reservoir and decided to drop in on his familiar notary for a cup of tea to see if he knew anything. A week went by. Victor had gone to town for a few days and Lucy missed him terribly. She was afraid to admit it to herself. She realized that she had become too attached to her lodger. Lucy was approaching the house when she saw a strange car at the gate. Her heart jumped and she quickened her step for she thought it was Robert. He was sitting at the head of the table and the boys were huddled on the couch. What are you doing here? Who invited you? Robert raised his hands playfully. Are you scolding me? Why are you scolding me? I came to visit the boys' relatives, and it turns out they don't consider me their brother. They don't consider you their brother, and you know it. Leave immediately. Robert's eyes narrowed unfriendly. We need to talk, Lucy. We have nothing to talk about. You're mistaken. We have a lot to talk about. Shall we talk here, or shall we go out in the yard? Lucy saw that the boys were very frightened and pointed to the door. Let's go outside. Robert went outside, waited for her, and started talking right away. So, my dad, your husband messed up something before he died, and it needs to be fixed, and then I'll leave you alone. Lucy felt a pounding in her temples. What's this got to do with me? I didn't interfere in my husband's affairs. And anyway, what can you say about a man who abandoned his own children? Well, you were supposed to make sure your husband stayed out of other people's business. Lucy smiled. Let's get down to business. You need to sign some papers. I'm not signing anything. I have nothing to do with my husband's business or yours. Oh, mommy. Lucy turned to leave the house, but Robert grabbed her arm and squeezed it painfully. Would you sign this? Let go. It hurts. It'll hurt more. I promise you. He barely had time to speak before he was gone. Lucy only then heard him scream. Victor was standing next to her, rubbing her arm. If I see you here again, I'll break your arms and legs. He and his mother were good psychologists. They could crush anyone weaker than them. But against Robert's physical strength, they were always at a disadvantage. Lucy, we need to go to town right away. Get all the papers and let's go. There's no time to explain. I'll explain everything on the way. Lucy wanted to ask something, but then quickly went into the house. Twenty minutes later, they were on their way. Victor explained that by a happy coincidence his friend was the very notary at whom Tam had secretly drawn up the documents with his first wife. And he'd agreed to stay late at work so that Victor could bring Lucy. She even cried a little, not such a bad man. Her husband was there for her. Apparently, somewhere in the depths of his soul, he still had something human. An hour later they were in the city, and two hours later they were there. Lucy was given the documents for her own apartment and some other papers which she did not understand at all. It would all be sorted out later. Now let's go to the store, get some good wine and go home. We'll celebrate two things at once. The boys jumped in the back seat. Yay, a party. What about the kebabs? Victor waved his hand, and the kebabs too. Lucy, still not fully recovered, looked at Victor carefully. He seemed too excited. It was unusual to see calm Victor in such a state. When the meat was already roasted, all the glasses were filled and the boys were playing on the grass outside the house waiting for dinner. Lucy asked quietly, Is something wrong? Victor smiled. You've studied me well. It's nothing special. It's just that I'm always uncomfortable. When a dream is shattered, I've been denied a lease. Or rather, they set a price I have to pay up front and it's too high. I have money, but not that much. So the idea of fish farming is out. But how come? They promised. Everything was almost ready, he shrugged. I gather someone else liked the idea. But I have to deny myself to make it look right. That's why this change. But it's not fair. Life isn't always fair. So shall we say goodbye? I'm going into town in the morning. Lucy looked at him and realized she felt like crying. 
She didn't want him to go. The boys were silent too. They sat across from each other and looked at their mother and Victor. Well, are you sad? Lucy did not sleep. She tossed and turned for a long time, then got up and went out on the porch. When she heard footsteps behind her, she was not frightened at all. A man's hands rested on her shoulders and Lucy turned around to find herself in Victor's strong arms. She'd been waiting for this and he'd been dreaming of it. He knew it would be even harder for him to leave. He knew he shouldn't do this, but there was nothing he could do. Ever since he closed his eyes, he couldn't sleep. So when he heard Lucy go outside, he immediately got out of bed. In the morning, the boys looked at a sad mom and an overly cheerful Victor. Did mom do anything to make him stay? Victor didn't understand what to do at all. Even yesterday, if something like this had happened, he would have stayed without hesitation. But now that Lucy was a wealthy woman, she had an apartment, she was doing fine on her own. Why would she want to lose to like him? He gathered up all his things and carried them to the car. Lucy sat silently in a chair. The boys settled down on the couch. They did not understand why things could not remain as before. The events of the last few days were completely incomprehensible to them. They realized that they could go home now, but they didn't want to. It was much better here. They really liked living together with Victor. He entered and stopped on the threshold. Well, let's say goodbye. Billy and Steve ran up to him and hugged him. Uncle Victor, can't you stay? Well, maybe we can work something out. If I could think of something, I would, because my savings are about to run out. And then what? I can't be your freeloader. Victor, you're a man. He smiled. Maybe God will provide something else. Lucy got up and came to him, looked into his eyes. Victor, if there was an investor who wanted to invest in your business, would it make a difference? He smiled. It would change everything. I'm sure he wouldn't regret it. Lucy looked at the guys, then said decisively, the guys and I want to be your investors. Victor's eyes widened. How could that be possible? The boys smiled. Now they understood why their mom had asked them today if they wanted to stay here for a while or go back to the city, and they declared that they wanted to live here, but not alone, but with Victor. Anyway, we decided that we're not ready to go back to the city yet and we want to live here. We could sell the apartment, invest the money in a business, and then, if the business is profitable, we will definitely buy something. Victor sat up in confusion, but Lucy smiled and for the first time in front of the children addressed him without her middle name. Victor, stay. We will miss you very much. He stood up, looked at Lucy for a long time, then said, then I have a favor to ask. Lucy, marry me. I honestly don't know if I would have had the strength to leave today or not. I didn't have to sell the apartment. Ariana broke free and demanded that she get back the part of the business that Tim had fraudulently taken from her. Lucy didn't hesitate to name a price. And then she stopped talking half-heartedly. She looked at Lucy carefully and, realizing that she was wrong, agreed. A year later, a little princess appeared in the family and her happy father and already a successful businessman bought all the balloons in the neighborhood. But that's another story.